This is Marlene with Miami Ghost Chronicles, and I want to welcome you to another episode of Stories of the Supernatural. Wherever you find us, whether it's a video or podcast on your favorite platform, please like and subscribe to us so that you can get notification of when a new show is released. You can also find us on major social media platforms. If you go to MiamiGhostChronicles.com, you can find links to the videos or MP3 files, which you can download and enjoy without commercial interruptions. If you're into classic horror, ghost, and adventure stories, I narrate Nightshade Diary, and you can find links at NightshadeDiary.com. If scary stories are your bag, and listening to encounters with cryptids, ghosts, dogmen, and other weird creatures sends a shiver up your spine, then go to SupernaturalStoryTime.com for links to our weekly podcasts. Noteworthy news about the paranormal world, true crime, conspiracy stories, and anything that is just plain weird can be found at eerie.news or visit the Stranger Than Fiction Stories tab at MiamiGhostChronicles.com. Please subscribe to my newsletter on Substack. Just go to mppelliser.com for a link. I want to thank you for being part of my audience, and I think you are all wonderful. Hi, how's everybody doing? Good, I hope. Everything going good? We... I'm preparing, even though I know the show's a little bit staggered on the release, I am preparing for spring, all right? Today, I have a, a screen porch, which I winterized, took everything down, all my chickens. I dewinterized everything in anticipation that the temperatures are starting to go back up and we're not going to get anything where I'm going to be like, oh, crap. And I know weather can get weird, but so far it looks that way. So I'm in, in anticipation of springtime. You could tell I'm done with the cold for a while until the summer rolls around and then I'll be ready to deal with the cold again. But outside of that, and of course, everybody's, you know, you know, I always make the comment about commercialization now, you know, of course, it's Easter and all that stuff. And, you know, it's it's it it seems like the year goes by going from (laughs) commercialized holiday to the next one. And uh, what was it the other day? I received uh, one of these. Mag- well, it was more like a catalog, which, by the way, there are still companies out there that send out catalogs in the mail. It wasn't addressed to me. It was one of those that ends up in your mailbox, but it's the resident. And I said, ah, oh, let me look at it. Because sometimes they do have unusual things that you, and I'm leafing through it. They've got stuff there already for, and I, I guess this is for the person that is into celebrating. They already had stuff for Halloween and Thanksgiving and uh Christmas, you know, holiday at the end of the year. In other words, they were already catering to these people that, hey, be ready. (laughs) I was like, holy crap. Wait a minute. No, 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 no. (laughs) Threw it in the trash. Just like none of this. No, before you know it, it's like, you know, talk talk, talk about time flies when you're having fun and even when you're not. Well, yeah, no, I got, you know, that, that, that old self-help live in the now. Yeah, that's, that's my, uh. That's the thing. Live in the now, like as in today, the next 24 hours. Anyway, but let's get on to the good part. The good part is who is the guest today at Stories of the Supernatural. This is the first time he's been here. His name is Larry E. Arnold. He is director of PSI Parascience International. Now, after leaving Lafayette College and a brief career in electrical engineering, Larry founded Parascience International in 1976 to pursue the exploration of Fortean anomalies in consciousness, His controversial article published in August of 1978 titled Meltdown at TMI 2 would eight months later be termed uncannily accurate by the Philadelphia Inquirer in presaging the future of the nuclear power plant's impossible Class 9 meltdown near his home. An author of four pioneering books, The Parapsychological Impact of the Accident at Three Mile Island, The Reiki Handbook, and A Blaze of Mysterious Fires of Spontaneous Human Combustion, Translated, which was translated to Japanese in 1998, is regarded by many as the world's expert on spontaneous human combustion and consequently by others as a mystery monger and world-class fool. He has published in, among others, Fate, Fortean Times, Info Journal, Life, Pennsylvania Association of Arson, Investigators, Newsletter, Pennsylvania Magazine, Pursuit, Society for the Investigation of the Unexplained, Esoterra, out of Germany, Science Digest, Seeing Journal, Rainbows, Susquehanna Monthly Magazine, UFO Annual, UFO Report, and UFO Universe. 
He has been a guest on hundreds of radio and internet radio programs, including Howard Stern, The Art Bell Show, and multiple episodes of Coast to Coast AM. He co-produced for and has appeared on numerous television programs, including That's Incredible and Best of That's Incredible. Uh, that was out of ABC and then The Unexplained on A&E, American Heroes Channel, Unexplained Mysteries, The Unreal World, The Fifth Estate, Beyond Belief. Boy, he's, he's been everywhere. The Unexplained Files, Ex Testers in Weird or What, and Weird or What, Investigation Acts and the Unexplained Files, Fringe, uh, Fox out of Fox and Fox Family, Extremely Weird. Well, it's that Fox has so many channels. History International, ITV4, Modern Miracles, Medical Mysteries on the Maury Povich Show. Unsolved Mysteries, The Other Side, Is It Real, National, which is on G National Geographic TV, Counters with the Unexplained, Investigation X, The Unexplained Files, Unsolved Mysteries, Sightings and Weird or What. I could keep going, but I'm going to lose all my time of interviewing him. <laughs> As of 2023, The Unexplained Files, episode is like the most aired of all science channels programming. He's lectured about the paranormal at Albright University, American University, Drew University, Elizabethtown College, Harrisburg Area Community College, Lebanon Valley College, Marist College, Messiah College, Shippensburg University, the University of Nebraska, and the Arthur Finley College for Psychical Studies in England. His unofficial website is parascience.com. We'll repeat that at the end for the podcast listeners. But anyway, help me welcome him. How are you two doing today, Larry? Hi, Marlene. Thank you for that wonderfully generous introduction. No, we that was great. To be with you this I got, I got, wait a minute. I'm going to run out my interview time. Okay. Uh, uh, I mean, I'm going to ask you, how did you get into this field back in the 70s, it sounds like? Coincidence uh, or what? Yeah, we, when we were studying mechanical engineering at Lafayette College in our sophomore year, we had a shift in consciousness, mm -hmm. and uh, we did not dismiss the scientific methodology that we had been raised in and did not throw out our interest in science and in mysteries, but that shift in consciousness led us into fields of psychic phenomena, um, means to broaden one's consciousness, and into the whole realm of Fortiana, things that science and scientists had been documenting um, with veracity and authenticity, but couldn't explain and, and consequently too often seemed to be ignoring what they were actually witnessing having happened. When we were in junior high school, we read a book um, by Frank Edwards called Stranger Than Science. And in that book, he had a chapter devoted to incredible cremations and specifically described one specific case that happened in your state of Florida on the west coast in St. Petersburg that burned up strangely a woman named Mary Hardy Reeser. Um, at that time it was said that she was an example of something called spontaneous human combustion. Certainly a Fortian phenomenon and after we left mechanical engineering and, and um, we're ending our work in the electrical engineering trade, we remembered that book that we read in junior high school and thought could there really be something here or had that author just made up a fascinating story to sell a couple more paperback books? Right. We went to the Library of Congress, pulled up microfilm in their newspaper archives and found out that the death of Mary Reeser in 1951 was a legitimate front page news story. And it seemed to have a lot of very unusual, mystifying aspects to it. How far back and was this? Was the, Did this occur, this Mary, Mary Reeser, Reeser thing? Mary Reeser met her flaming fate in July of 1951. Okay, so it was a few years back before, by the time yeah. that you were researching mm -hmm. it. Go ahead. Yeah, quite, quite a gap. Um, we thought, could, could this be a one-off case where, where the officials just kind of overlooked something that should have been easily understood and explainable? Or was this a really true bona fide scientific and medical anomaly that could not at that time be properly so solved? Ever. Right. And, 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 and let me ask you, yeah. this, by the by the newspaper and the investigators of that date and time. Is this what they called it as human combustion? They did. Yeah. Okay. Um, the history of SHC, um, spontaneous human combustion, or as we prefer to call it now, sudden human cremation, mm -hmm. keeping the acronym of SHC, um, historically goes back into the medical records into the 14 and 1500s. Um, it was a hotly debated, if you were part of the expression, subject um, in the 17 and up until the middle of the 1800s. 
At that time, a, a noted German chemist, von Liebig, decided that he was going to test the concept of SHC once and for all in his laboratory to see whether or not he could um, explain it conventionally or the mystery would remain. What one thought, von what von Liebig did was take some tissue, soak it in alcohol, and ignite it. And when the alcohol burned away, um, he was still left with an intact tissue sample. And therefore, von Liebig concluded that SHC cannot happen. And because he was a famous scientist in his day, had the notoriety in the mid-1800s that Einstein uh -huh. has in our current um, existence, his conclusions stuck. And since that time, uh, from now more than a, almost 150 years, if not more, um, mainstream fire science and medicine has, has accepted his conclusion that SHC is an impossibility. It does not happen. No good, no good can be served by discussing it. The only people who advance that it is still possible are people like ourselves, pseudosciences, who are mystery mongers. Um, we will refute that. The evidence that we have amassed in, in investigating not only the Risa case, but hundreds of others like her, puts the lie to the contention and the belief pattern that SHC is impossible. There is a true bona fide medical and scientific mystery here in these amazing cases. And we can go into detail and explain why with the Risa case or with the Dr. Bentley case or many others that we've documented. Right, because this is, this is something you sent me was, which is, I guess, from what you got from, so in other words, even though the, the investigators of that day called it that, they couldn't explain it, this gentleman is saying this, that that's impossible, is what you're saying. That doesn't happen. Yeah, we, we could as... fill up the rest of this hour on talking to your guests, quoting expert after expert after expert mm -hmm. who, in their hubris, says that the phenomenon of SHC is an impossibility, a medical impossibility, a biological impossibility. There's no way to explain it because there's no way that the body can generate this amount of energy or heat within itself to action itself more completely than can be done in a crematorium retort under normal operating conditions. Okay. And Mrs. Reeser in 1951 in your state of Florida is a prime example of what the body can do to itself, even though the experts say it can't happen. So, and this, he, just out of curiosity, he came to this conclusion under just one experiment. That was it? One, to the best one. of our knowledge, yeah, he did the experiment once. Uh, we've done the same experiment three times, always with the same result that von Liebig got. Um, mm -hmm. we, in, in one case that we did for the, for the BBC network in Britain, we had marinated a, a sample of uh, tissue with a bone. It was a ham shank with bone included, marinated that in a blend of whiskey, brandy, and vodka for a year, took it out, okay. wrapped it in cotton, lit it, and with an infinite amount of oxygen uh, supplied to the sample. After an hour, the, the fire um, that was fueled by the alcohol uh, went out and we had a sample of the tissue 99 percent still intact it was not burned to ash the significance of saying that is that when a body a cadaver is put in a crematorium retort at temperatures right. of 22 to 2400 degrees fahrenheit for an hour to two hours perhaps what comes out of the retort is not powder but bone fragments bone fragments are put on a cremulator fancy name for a bone grinder um, so that the bone fragments are reduced quite literally to powder, mechanically reduced to powder, not by the fire that is put in. Right, that's what I the understood yeah. that, that right. um, you know how sometimes you hear of criminals trying to burn a body of evidence and that's quite difficult because there's it always something left. It is quite difficult, left. yes. Mm -hmm. you, you're, you're, you're very knowledgeable in this, Marlene. Um, in fact, we just looked at a case recently from Illinois where a person was um, burned quite severely in a structure fire. The victim was burned so badly that the fire chief was quite made uncomfortable by trying to describe how badly the victim had been burned. And enough, uh, yet enough of the body was able to be pulled out of the structure fire, taken to a morgue, autopsied, and the criminalist could find evidence of not only foul play, but foul play done by two separate individuals wow. enough of the body sample was left to to enable that determination to be made in cases like mrs reeser and others that we'll probably be talking about with you shortly there was not enough of a body left to 
for any competent criminologist to make such a determination. Mary Reeser in the evening of July 1st, 1951 was a um, rather rotund 175 pound woman. Okay. Um, seen by her son, who was a physician, the evening of July 1, about 9 p.m. that evening, sitting in her chair, uh, wearing her accustomed rayon acetate night robe, uh, with two satin slippers on her feet, legs outstretched. She probably took two second old sleeping tablets to help her go to sleep. The following morning, less than 12 hours later, um, when a telegram was to be delivered to her, um, the landlady, Pansy Carpenter found that the doorway to, or the door handle to Mrs. Reese's apartment was hot to the touch. She screamed, which alerted two painters across the street. They rushed over and broke the door down. And at that point, they witnessed for the first time a scene that later uh, Dr. Wilton Krogman, a renowned forensic anthropologist, would describe as macabre beyond words. Okay. Uh, what you're seeing here, what you're showing to your audience are two firefighters yes. from the St. Pete Fire Department shoveling up the ashes of Mrs. Reeser. Overnight, her body had re been reduced from 175 pounds to about eight pounds of ash and rubble. That included the remains of the chair in which she was known to be seated and, a, and an adjoining side table. And, to do this kind and, of- And that was it, that was that nothing else like that was all that was burnt, considering? That, that was pretty much all that was burned in her apartment. Um, a pair of candles about 12 feet away had melted down. Mm -hmm. There was blackening by apparent soot um, at an elevation four feet above the floor and up into the ceiling. But no other significant fire or heat damage in her apartment. No odor of burned flesh. Again, atypical. Right. I was going to ask that. I goes, nobody yeah. smelled like, hey, what? That smells like flesh burning. Or <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In a normal fatal fire, um, the, the odor of burned human tissue, we have been told again and again, is quite noxious yes. and extremely difficult to rid from. The environment yes. not the case with mrs reeser and not the case in what history would would define as classic spontaneous human combustion um this case took up took an interest by dr wilton krogman who was a renowned forensic anth anthropologist back in the 40s and 50s he had been vacationing just south of saint pete when mrs reeser burned herself down not up but down um right because what was left case. was the legs right just Most and actually just her foot um the, oh. the official <laughs> description the official description for mrs reese's remains is this one foot intact with a satin slipper a few pieces of calcine vertebrae and a head that was said at the time to have shrunken to the size of a baseball or teacup now human heads don't do then a fierce fire they explode um if that description is accurate, this raises all kinds of quandaries and mysteries about how one woman could burn herself so completely, more thoroughly than, as we said earlier, a crematorium retort can accomplish. And yet clearly in her apartment, there was no evidence of temperatures exceeding 2000 degrees Fahrenheit. In fact, Dr. Krogman wrote that he had conducted several experiments on the effects of fire on cadavers. And he told us that only when the temperature was at 3000 degrees Fahrenheit for 12 uninterrupted hours, would he be able to produce an incineration scene as complete, as thorough, and as destructive as what Mrs. Reeser left in her apartment the morning of July 2, 1951. Quite astonishing. That's, that's and you know what, that reminds me, um, you know, that they have, well, not so much, but before they used to have in South America and Central America, uh, some of the tribes that used to do the shrunken heads, or what they mm -hmm. call Santas. And, and they described that to get that, like what you were talking about, what they get the shrunken head, of course, is it, it's a process. That's not easily done, what you just described, as far as, you know, th there's a process that they do, obviously. And part of it is, you know, the heat and stuff. But that's incredible that her head had shrunken down like that. It's, if the report is accurate, it is absolutely incredible. And even if that report about her shrunken head is inaccurate, we still have the overwhelming scene itself that just defies common sense. And her case is not unique. Um, 
some of our critics have called us a mystery monger that we're making up these stories. This is our file on Mary Reeser. This is one case. Now, if we're a mystery monger, we're not going to create a file this thick. This contains the photographs, the Let FBI me ask you, she file. wasn't, because I'm, I'm going to think of, I'm going to interrupt you. Was she a smoker? And any, did, did they throw any of the usual excuses? She fell asleep with a cigarette yeah. in her hand or something like that? No? Yeah. Mary, Mary Reeser was a known smoker. Okay. And she took, as we said, two second all tablets that, that evening before she was discovered to help her sleep. So the argument went initially that, yes, okay. she's a smoker. She fell asleep. She dropped a cigarette on her lap and poof, over several hours, a low temperature smoldering fire consumed her body to powder. Unfortunately wow. for that rational explanation, the, the officials at the time could not buy that. They were absolutely bumfuddled. They said that the yes. police chief, um, let's see if we can find the quote here. Um, yeah, police chief Jake Riker said the Reeser case, quote, is the most unusual case I've seen in my almost 25 years of police work, end quote. The, the members of the St. Pete Fire Department were saying basically the same thing. You showed a photo of two firefighters shoveling up her ashes in her apartment. We, we yes. had spoken to Nelson Aders, one of those two firefighters. He told us that in his professional experience, he had never before or after Mrs. Reese's death encountered in his firefighting career in St. Pete anything that resembled this particular individual fire scene. He told us that in his professional firefighting experience, she had died by spontaneous human combustion. The other firefighter who has stooped over is, is Buddy Standish. We did not have the inter opportunity to interview him, but we did meet uh, last August down in St. Pete, his son. And okay. his son told us that his father was really reluctant to talk about this case but again and again, when he did, he used the word bizarre, which okay. would certainly be appropriate. Sure. I can imagine. In, she, it was like, how do you make head or tails of this? Yeah. In time, um, it was determined. In fact, when, when we, um, as we were pursuing our research in the research case, we, we corresponded again and again with the same police fire and police departments. In 1995, this case was still an open investigation. So... 45 really? years later, it was still an open case, which is extraordinary. Now, quite recently, we were told that they have closed the case and it's it's been written off, closed case. Um, in time, it was determined that, yes, Mrs. Weezer indeed dropped a cigarette on her lap and slowly smoldered to powder. We have tried that experiment, as we said, we cannot get it to work that way. We have spoken to dozens of crematorium owners. Not one of them has ever told us that in their professional careers as cremationist could they ever reduce a cadaver to the extent that mrs reeser was found did what did her son did he ever say something what his opinion was that had happened to his mother yes he did uh dr reeser we, we we tried desperately several times to meet with him initially he refused to discuss the case with us and and psychologically that's understandable um to sure. claim that you have a next of kin who died by something as bizarre and mysterious as spontaneous human combustion puts up some mental barriers um mm -hmm. he he at one point did agree to speak with us and then his wife uh, stifled that opportunity for us his contention is that, yes, she dropped a cigarette in her lap and, and sadly and unfortunately smoldered to death. Um, if any of our naysayers can replicate this fire scene by doing that, we're going to be surprised at this point. Because as we said, we've been unable to do it. No crematorium operator has told us that he or she has been able to do this. Um, the reason why I ask this is this just I'm, I'm going on, you know, that tangent. And maybe, and he wouldn't. Maybe did she ever have incidents in her during her lifetime where fires would get started? I'm thinking of the fire starter kind of mm -hmm. mentality, you know. No, no, no. Yeah, we know where you're going, Marlene. To our knowledge, mm -hmm. no. Um, we we've been we have been able to interview some of her next of kin, her relatives. No family member ever. Mentioned and I'm not talking. Like I'm not that. talking setting. I'm not talking arson. What I'm talking about is yeah. where fires would start. Mm -hmm. Like that, out yeah. of nowhere. Okay. Like, like, like in Stephen King's Firestarter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. There are cases in history very much like that. Uh, we, we mentioned a few in our book of Blaze. We have a whole perspective book uh, in the works that are focused specifically on poltergeist-type fires. But again, we, we know of no evidence that would connect Mrs. Reeser to that, that specific okay. type of pyro phenomena. Right, yeah. And, and again, there's doubt. it's doubtful maybe even her son would 
say, well, yeah, you know, my mom told me that every once in a while stuff would start smoldering in a room when she was a kid. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> you know, but I'm always curious as far as maybe is it, is it kinetic? Yeah. You know, or how did, yeah. But anyway, I'm going to ask you about that later on. So here you are, you did an investigation into this as far as looking at it. And let me ask you, why was this gentleman that did that one experiment, why was his word so finite? How's that? As far as... Yeah. he he His reputation in 1850 in the scientific community in Europe was sterling. Ah, if okay. Baron von Liebig said something, everybody just by default accepted his word okay. as... All right. Bonafide. I see what you're going with that. <laughs> and he, he, he had the reputation, and when he spoke, that was the end of the issue. Whatever he decreed mm -hmm. was accepted as scientific fact. Unfortunately, um, 150 plus years later, um, his mistake remains. His There is nothing to criticize about his experiment. As we said, we've done it ourselves with the same result. Mm -hmm. Our contention is that he simply used the wrong fuel and invoked the wrong hypothesis to reach his conclusion. Uh, as an example, um, if we put a gallon of water mm -hmm. in the gas tank of our DeLorean and turn the ignition key, that, that DeLorean is going to go nowhere. Okay. If we put a gallon of 92 octane gasoline in the fuel tank and turn the ignition key, we're going to take that DeLorean down the street. Okay. What what von Liebig did was use the wrong fuel. We submit. Okay. He used alcohol and soaked the meat tissue in that um, base of alcohol. Once the alcohol burned off, there was no fuel left. Um, for the fire to continue burning into the, the meat tissue. So he was left with an intact sample, which is what happened in, in the three experiments that we have done over the years. Um, choose a different fuel, and he might got a, a very different result that would have resembled what happened to Mrs. Reeser or Dr. Bentley, which we would love to talk to next, talk about next. Okay, so he, um, in other words, what you're saying is his premise was that it was from the from the beginning, the the experiment, just the way it was set up, like you said, the hypothesis, and of course the result that it got, whatever whatever his hypothesis was, proved to be true or, or inaccurate. I don't know what his original hypothesis was, but it sounds like it was like no bodies don't burn this way. So I know that you said that there was history of other times where people have done the same thing. Yes, before and after the Weezer case. As we said, um, we can trace this phenomenon medically back to the 1500s. Uh, we can okay. go farther back into history by looking at mythology and, and legends from Greek and Roman times. We can also bring the, case, the, the, the phenomenon much more recently than that. Um, in 1975, we got wind of another case that had Pennsylvania connections. Our home state is Pennsylvania. Mrs. Weezer grew up in Lancaster County, had moved temporarily down to Florida where she met her flaming fate, but she was planning to move back to Pennsylvania. She did so, but in, in a box of ashes, um, not as she intended to do so. Right. In 1975, we got tipped off to a case that sounded remarkably like what happened to Mrs. Weezer again here in our home state of Pennsylvania. It had enough hallmarks that seemed to duplicate what happened to Mary Weezer that we took an interest in it. We made some phone calls, spoke to some first responders, spoke to the coroner, the deputy coroner, and decided that um, we needed to look deeper into the case of the death of Dr. John Irving Bentley here in Pennsylvania uh, that happened in okay. December of 1966. We learned about it nine years later. What we discovered okay. in pursuing the case of Dr. Bentley was that he burned up very much like Mrs. Reeser did, perhaps even more completely, more dramatically than, than the ashes that Mrs. Reeser left behind. Dr. Bentley's story very succinctly is this. Um, the evening of December 4, 1966, a Sunday night, he was visited by his caretakers in Cowdersport, Northern Pennsylvania. Apparently in good health, um, quite, quite astute. And when they bid him a good night, um, the following morning, um, he was expected to be visited by the local gas meter reader, Don Gosnell. When Mr. Gosnell showed up at Dr. Bentley's home the morning of December 5, 1966, to read the meter in the basement, 
Mr. Gosnell discovered in the basement floor after he read the gas meter was a pile of ashes five inches in height, 14 inches in diameter. Mr. Gosnell was also a volunteer fireman in Countersport. He walked over, okay. kicked the mound of ashes on the earthen floor with his boot and wondered what had burned because the last oh time he was down in the basement, yes. this pile of powder wasn't there. Mr. Gosnell looked overhead to see if that would have been the source of the fire or the pile of ashes and noticed in the, in the basement ceiling a hole in the basement ceiling about two and a half by three feet in size. There were some cherry embers around the perimeter of that hole, and Gosnell told us that he thought to himself, gee, there must have been a fire here in Dr. Bentley's house overnight or quite recently. I wonder why the fire department, myself included, didn't get a call to come out and put it out. This is an early picture of Dr. Bentley when he was in better health in his younger years and looking very good and dashing and debonair. Right, right, yeah. You could tell he's, he, he was, was born in 74, yeah. Yeah, he was a country physician. The, 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 the people in Countersport just loved this guy. He had a sterling mm -hmm. reputation. He was beloved by everybody we spoke to who knew the gentleman. The morning of December 5, 1966, after Don Gosnell noticed a pile of powder on the earthen floor in the basement, he, he went back upstairs. But before leaving Dr. Bentley's home, he wanted to knock on the door to make sure that Doc Bentley was alive and well. Knocked on the door, got no response. Mr. Garsnell walked into the apartment. It was a two-room apartment, a sitting bedroom, and an adjoining bathroom. Gosnell did not find Dr. Bentley in the sitting room, stepped deeper into the apartment, peered into the bathroom, and saw, I'm sure you'll pull up the photograph next, what has become the poster child for classic spontaneous human combustion. Overnight, Dr. John Irving Bentley reduced himself who weighed about 180 pounds the night before, to a few pounds of basically powder and one leg and a kneecap. And this the is when I guess body. this gentleman must have thought. Let me see if I could. I'm going here through your through the. I'm 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 I'm, I'm like I I can imagine this gentleman that discovered him that you said was a volunteer fireman. Yeah, he volunteer must have firefighter. been firefighter. He must have been. I don't know. I'm trying to think what he was thinking. He must have been like, no, this doesn't work. This doesn't, this doesn't happen this way. No, it doesn't. Um, he see, he he see. left the, he, he left the home. This is, we're showing we're holding up a photo. There, there you got it. This is mm -hmm. this is Dr. Bentley in the morning of December 5, 1966. Half of one leg, a few pieces of um well, that the one the one bone fragment that was identified at the scene was his patella. It was found on a post in the basement. And under the aluminum walker was a round over a mass that we believe is Dr. Bentley's skull, burned so badly that some of the first responders could not recognize it as a human head. We were at this fire scene. We were attest to the validity, the, the historical validity of this photograph. We know the photograph, the photographer who took it and gave us this photograph. This is okay. not Photoshop. This is not AI created again. This photograph was taken on the on, on the Monday of December 5, 1966, long before Photoshop and AI existed. Yes. As Don Gosnell said, he he ran out of the house, down to his work office, ran into the building. Uh, his his um, co-workers told us that his face was white as a ghost. And all Don could spurt out to them was this quote, Dr. Bentley's burned up. In our view, right. probably, arguably, the understatement of 1966, because Doc Bentley indeed had burned up, or more precisely, burned down. He burned almost completely through three oaken beams in the four boards below the bathroom flooring. What? The floor material and the bathroom itself was tar-based linoleum, highly flammable material. The bathtub that you can see in the upper part of the photograph uh -huh. The blackened area is from soot from the combustion. The bathtub was painted with enamel paint. You would expect the paint to have blistered. It did not blister. As we said, we stood in the bath in the bathroom where this event happened. We stand six feet tall with our arm outstretched. We can touch the ceiling. There was not a scorch mark, not a heat mark directly above the hole on the you know, through which Dr. Bentley immolated downward. As in the research case, there was the absence of noxious burned tissue. 
smell. Mm -hmm. In fact, Don Gosnell's first reaction when he walked into the hallway to get to the meter in the basement was that there was a sweet, odd aroma in the hallway of Dr. Bentley's home. Dr. Bentley's home was built in the 1800s. It was highly a highly combustible environment. Okay. All right. Um, the entire that. structure to, to create this kind of damage by fire to a human body should require mm -hmm. the entire structure to have burned to the ground. And even then, you will not find a body burned this completely. As we said with the case from Ireland, uh, from, from um, Illinois a couple of years ago, the body could be removed, taken to a morgue, autopsied, and evidence found of mur murder, arson, crime. You would not find a stab wound, a gunshot wound in Dr. Bentley's ashes. That is how completely burned was his body. Right, there was no, there was no nick on a bone that you could say, well, that's where the... <laughs> No. And, and, and apparently he did the same thing. What was left was the, the legs. The ending of the legs is what's left one, behind. One leg in this case. Yes, there's half of one leg. That is his legacy to the world, if you will. Dr. Bentley had broken his, his hip about 15 years earlier, so he used that aluminum walker to locomote through his mm -hmm. two-room apartment. Um, the skeptics say that Dr. Bentley dropped a match or his pipe on his lap and was rushing to the bathroom in search of water to put out his burning bathrobe and just didn't quite succeed in the task. Problem upon problem upon problem upon problem with that scenario, that explain away. First, Dr. Bentley was a known pipe smoker, but his pipe was found neatly placed in a pipe holder on a stand next to the chair. If Dr. Okay. Bentley had dropped a lit pipe or or lit match on his lap and awakened, he was keen of mind. He was slow of body, but keen of mind. As a physician, he would have known the first thing you do is drop and roll, get out of your burning right. garment. If his garment was ablaze, it took him a full five minutes to hobble with his walker from his sitting chair in the living room uh -huh. to the bathroom where he would have had a source of water. He would not have survived a five minute trek with his walker to get to the bathroom and then burn to the extent that he did. Yes. A bathroom does not provide sufficient fuel loading to incinerate, or incinerate a body to this extent. Dr. Bentley's aluminum walker is clearly intact, directly yes, above the yes. hole to which his body emulated. Aluminum will melt at 1200 degrees Fahrenheit. It is clearly intact. So we're looking at a temperature that had to be below 1200 degrees Fahrenheit. That's half the temperature that a crematorium retort operates at. As we said, no heat damage to the ceiling. The enamel. It's almost like it's contained in a very away. narrow area, which is like incredible because very how do you contain? Yep. And I'm gonna t I'm gonna interject yep. something. I have big burn piles. I have big trees I've brought down. How do you contain? And it? well, it's my thing okay. is that even this is a tree. This is. Sometimes, especially when you have bigger, bigger, as a matter of fact, I have big trunks out there. I had some very old oaks that came down. You can't burn them. I still have, I'm going to have to do a second round of burning them. And this is wood. Okay. My point being, what you were saying, as far as to be able to cremate a body to down to ashes in what, I guess, what, hours between the time they were last seen to when they're discovered. That's that's difficult. That's and it and fire. I mean, a lot of people think sometimes fires sometimes will take off if the setting is right, but there's other times that I I know because I I start fire all the times because I burn a lot of stuff here on my property. It's not as easy as one thinks to keep a fire mm -hmm. going, especially inside. You know where there's, it's, you know when the wind blows. You know how you see, you see people blow to get a fire going. That's usually one of the things, but I'm thinking, let's say this is sure. inside a, house, a building. There's no, fa no fanning of the flames, in other words. Okay. Right. And then it's contained doc, doc, in doc, this doc, little doc, area. Yeah. That's incredible. Doc, Dr. Bentley burned up in December. It's cold, very cold in Northern Pennsylvania in December. So he did not have windows open. There was no cross ventilation. Right. Um, it was not an airtight structure, but you, you had, you had the, you know, oxygen and the air in the building, and that was basically it. Um, the that, the oaken that's, beams. That's my point. One of those that oaken beams is, yeah. One of the oaken beams. That, that is people don't burn really up that true. easily. I guess is my point. No. As people no, as, as easily don't. as people think, they don't. 
under normal circumstances. How's that? Well, you just described that if it was accidental and something like a match or something fell, it's not like it's going to fall and you go and you burst into flame unless you're doused with accelerant. But even then, so what you were saying that if it was an accidental, whatever match fell on him or something, he could have put it up. Yeah, there's. In, in both of these cases, there was no evidence of foul play. There was no accelerant having been involved. Uh-huh. Um, there was no provable external ignition source linked to either body. Um, so therein lies a mystery. Um, we have looked at cases involving massive amounts of accelerant. Um, one that comes immediately yes. to mind happened on the Schuylkill Expressway outside of Philadelphia several years ago, where a motorist... Um, Unfortunately, collided with a gasoline tanker truck. The, the, wow. the tanker exploded. 8,000 gallons of gasoline was aflame. The temperature Whoa. was so hot that it buckled the rebar in the concrete of the Schuylkill Expressway. And wow. yet, the victim in the, in the car could be extricated from the vehicle after the fire was extinguished and could be identified based on, medic, on, on dental records. That mm-hmm. is how difficult it can be to burn a body. Clearly, conditions like that were not present in Mary Reese's apartment. Clearly not present in Dr. Bentley's home in Countersport in 1966. So, is there a of- history that these victims live alone? Or, like, I guess what I'm going with this is there, do they ever live with somebody where somebody's in another room? <laughs> Are you going to love the answer to this? Um, back in the 1700s and, and up until von Liebig did his, his, his experiment in the mid-1800s, this was a fiercely and hotly debated subject within the European medical community with some very interesting caveats. It was said that all victims of this alleged phenomenon were elderly, female, alcoholics who were sedentary, overweight, and lived alone. Our research dis debunks every one of those aspects. Um, by gender, 50% of our database are female, 47% are male. History doesn't tell us the gender of the remaining 3%. So by gender, by sex, about 50-50, close enough. Okay. Um, some victims are certainly elderly. Um, mm-hmm. Most of them are elderly, and we would expect that because as the body ages, biological processes tend to break the body down. That's not a surprise. The youngest victim in our database currently is probably a six-week-old toddler in a crib. Uh, We have children to whom this happens. Um, Some of the victims do live alone. Others um, burn up in the proximity of next of kin. We actually have a case... um, from Vitry, France in 1731, where one where two females were sleeping in a bed together. One of the females awakened to discover, much no doubt to her horror, a real true life nightmare that her companion had burned to powder in the bed overnight as they slept beside one another. My God, that's incredible. It's like, and I guess, that's that's that that thing also about the toddler you know you i've never heard of that and let me ask you and and, and i'm sure because I, it sounds like you've looked at all these different cases you know whether you know how age and you know have you found a common denominator among the cases we have certainly looked for common denominators common traits mm-hmm. um that all these victims would share. It would make explaining the phenomenon so, so much easier. We have not been able to do that. And it certainly has not been for absence of trying to do so. Um, We've looked at, we've attempted to look at psychological profiles of the victims, looking Uh for common factors. Are they all type A personalities? We just can't get that information. And not surprisingly, fire departments tend not to even look at that kind of information sure. when they're filing their post-fire um, reports. Um, do they all have the same diet? No. Uh, Dr. Bentley, we were told for the last three years of his life, subsisted on a diet of shredded wheat and coffee. Um, oh, my God. We've chuckled sometimes that maybe you know, the body yeah. just got tired of shredded wheat and coffee and decided we're going to do something and else And even about then, I, I don't see how that, I don't know. I, I don't get yeah. it. Like, you know, what you're ingesting into your, your, how could that make you like, poof? Yeah, yeah I don't know. Yeah. 
But again, from what you're telling me, there is nothing that you can say, you know what, we found this and this and this, even though they're very dissimilar in circumstances and sex and whatever, there's this one thing that we have found across the board. Yeah. You know, and I know sometimes you don't know everything about everybody, especially these people, if it was maybe hundreds of years or decades ago. So, all right. I mean, like, hey, don't do this or don't be there. You know, as far as the something, what's the word I'm looking for? Something that is the catalyst or yeah. the nexus for people bursting into flame. We wish we could find it. It would make our job so much easier, which is the reason that we've been unsuccessful in finding any commonality to the mm -hmm. hundreds of cases that we've collected over the decades of our life looking into this phenomenon is that there likely is not a single explanation, which is why in our book Ablaze, we, we look at, consider, and offer for consideration about 120 different theories. You can okay. throw them all out, you can accept all of them, or you can give us five more theories. We don't care. Um, the mystery remains, the, the solution to this fiery phenomenon is yet to be found. And how about location, geography, anything like that? No, no. Yeah. Location is offering the one possible common factor to many of these cases. We have more cases per capita of the phenomenon of SHC in the United Kingdom than in any other part of the planet. Really? With okay. a fairly large database, we're looking for patterns. What we did in 1975 was to plot all the cases that we had in our files at that time of spontaneous human and spontaneous property combustions on uh -huh. a map. And okay. then we looked for patterns. What we discovered is what we now call fire lanes, the alignment of unusual fires. We found that these mysterious baffling blazes could be connected by straight alignments linking three four, five, and in one case that roughly parallels the east coast of the United Kingdom from southeast England up into the Scottish Highlands may connect as many as a dozen cases of anomalous fires. Statistically, that is incredibly significant and deserves further study. It certainly that, raises some very interesting issues for the um, actuarial industry and the insurance industry. I bet. <laughs> I bet. If you're that at the right incredible. place, but the yeah, wrong time, that. you you or your house may become an incendiary hazard to your house or your property. If the test of a theory is that it leads you, does it lead you to new discoveries, then the concept mm -hmm. of the alignment of fire lanes has been proven to our satisfaction because what we did after we plotted this map that you're showing to your listeners and to your audience now in mm -hmm. 1975 was to do another research trip to the United Kingdom in 1977. When we went up to the, um, where that bevy of combustions is plotted on the east coast of England, that's up in the Lincolnshire area, we had a number of unusual fires and other types of Fortean phenomena occurring in that area, particularly back in 1905 and 1908. Might there be more, some more recent fires that we did not know about if we went to that area and spoke to the officials. What we did was meet with the fire brigade commander for Lincolnshire, sat down in his office, introduced ourselves, explained why we were there, and did he have any unusual fires in his jurisdiction that he could tell us about. His first reaction was, no, what you're talking about, Larry, doesn't happen. But then he got really quiet, very pensive, and thought. And he comes uh -huh. back and he says, well, you know, a couple of years ago, Larry, we had this yeah, we had this really weird fire out in Kirkley on Bain. The neighbors of the gentleman who lived in a tinderbox of an environment told us that they hadn't seen him in a couple of days. Please come out and see if he's okay. They went into the house, couldn't find him. The neighbors insisted that he had to be somewhere inside his tar paper of a shack environment. Firefighters went back in and discovered that they had been walking through his ashes, ashes oh. that were lying between stacks of newspaper that themselves oh. had not burned. The wow. other example of that was in 1980, we heard about a similar case that happened to a gentleman named Henry Thomas over in Wales in a place called Ebervale. We had no idea where Ebervale was, but we, we got this map out 
and trace the lines that the, the the alignment of fires that go through Wales. And guess what? One of those alignments went right through Ebervale. Henry Thomas burned up in a localized fire in his apartment in in a way that's duplicated what happened to to Mary Weezer and to Dr. Bentley. So it looks to us like the alignment of these strange fires um, has a great deal of merit and, and certainly is worthy of further pursuit. It's kind of analogous to the alignment of megalithic structures, Stonehenge, uh -huh. and so on. Um, but in that case where the energies supposedly affect either the environment or the consciousness of the person who is on those telluric energy patterns. In the case of the fire lanes, we're dealing with a, a different type of energy vibration, which produces combustion fire phenomena. Have you, have this, has this happened to animals? It has. We document a few cases in the book where the were spontaneous, me, no, Marvin, what where spontaneous about? animal combustion has happened to cats, dogs, uh, sheep, really? cattle. Yeah. So that's factor that, that they, in. And, and it's and, and it's the same process where this animal for no reason just and then has it been witnessed like I can't imagine that that's got to be like what? Oh, that's a wonderful question to raise because <laughs> the debunkers, the naysayers of SHG just hate what we're going to tell you now. Yes, the phenomenon has been witnessed. Most okay. often what the witnesses report historically is seeing the victim engulfed in a bright electric blue flame, in air quotes, ah. a light. Now, this tells us if the that the process is not an oxidizing type of combustion fire. It's electrical or plasma or subatomic uh -huh. or something other than what happens when you strike a match or light a yes. gas stove burner. We do have reports of copper red fire or flame, um, silver, argent, blue green, but most often predominantly the historical record says that when this phenomenon is observed, it's a bright electric blue light that engulfs the individual. And it's very quick. Is this something like a very, very quick, very yeah. quick. That's what very I was quick. thinking that it's just this moment of like extreme. And then maybe that's why things around it don't get singed in some cases. We believe so. Yeah. Whatever, whatever this energy is, it has either a very low thermal component or if it is high heat, it is so fast that surrounding combustibles, paint, paper, linen, um, is not impacted by that heat. It's Nothing like static, fire. no static. You know how when people, I don't want to ask mm -hmm. this, you know, like when you get that static charge, nothing like that, right? I mean, considering. Well, it could be something like that. We do have cases, um, again, when we began our research, uh, well, when we were going, going up through high school uh, in the 50s and 60s, um, ball lightning was considered to be a myth, a fable. Now ball lightning is accepted by mainstream science and indeed it can be created in laboratories. We do have some cases where it appears that ball lightning or some other phenomenon in nature very much like ball lightning is the external causative mechanism that causes some people's bodies to smoke or blister or to burn okay. spontaneously. So in some of the cases we do have an explanation, but right. again, if you had not seen the fireball striking the person's hand, um, mm -hmm you'd end up with simply a spontaneous burn with no explanation, no understanding of, of but what it's only like localized. In other words, it's, it's localized, not like, yeah, right. It's not so far. We don't know of a fireball creating a whole body human incineration event. That's correct. I mean, I, I, in my mind, I'm thinking, and see, so, you know, some of these things I understand are, in, are in, well, impossible you know, because you would have to be able to speak to these people that were incinerated, like asking them, did you feel something weird that day? Or was there something, you know, did you feel like, was there, did you feel hot? But, you know, you can't, you can't go back in time and, and you know, it's impossible. Is, you know, as but far as, it's, it's like, lucky you, it's your turn. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you're gone. That, that recalls a, a funny story. Years ago, um, the David Letterman program contacted us. Would we be willing to okay. come on, on, and talk with David Letterman about this phenomenon. We said, sure, that'll be fun. We can kick around, have some great time and, and get some useful information out to the public through, through, through David Joe. 
we're all ready to do this. And, and the producer comes back and says, but we need you to provide somebody who will spontaneously combust on camera. It's well, like, what? <laughs> no, we can't quite do that. So end, end of opportunity. Um, okay, but that's kind of like, all right. Does he understand that what you're asking? Basically, you want to you want to. OK, you want to wig out your audience. Yeah, let's let's show yeah. somebody. <laughs> no, that, that, that would be the, the the ultimate stupid human trick for David. Yeah, exactly, um, exactly, obviously, exactly. Obviously, we could not meet the criteria, the the qualifications. So that 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 at that point fell through. Yeah. Um, Man, but it you, also that would be a one of forgettable people, late yeah. night show and be like, what? <laughs> Whether whether they really understood what they were asking us to do, we it wasn't wasn't clear. Um, what we do say is we we've tried to be very careful and diligent and meticulous and methodical in the research that we do in this phenomenon. It is incredibly easy to just blow it off as as happenstance yes. as mystery mongering. Um, mm -hmm. We showed you the file that we have in Mrs. Research. We have spoken to we don't know how many first responders at these fire scenes around the right. world. Um, mm -hmm. We've collected probably the, the largest number of photographic documentation of this phenomenon. The okay. photographs are real historical documents that prove this phenomenon is a reality that deserves serious consideration by mainstream science. We have caught our critics lying in public about their success in proving, let's say, the Wick theory, which is what is most often promulgated to explain away the mystery of these cases. Um, John DeHaan, we have no hesitation anymore bringing out names. John DeHaan, until his death in, 20, in 2022, was this country's leading fire expert. Okay. He continually persisted and argued with us that SHC doesn't happen, that all these people are victims of dropped cigarettes or carelessly placed pipes that once okay. the body is external, once the clothing is externally ignited, they, they become go. a human candle, the wick effect. This is John DeHaan. Right. So there's no mystery as far as Mr. DeHaan is concerned. John did four experiments televised that we know of. The first one was done for the BBC. And before the producer left us to film John doing his experiment in California, we told the producer, if John succeeds in doing what he claims he's going to do for you, we'll be impressed and it will be medically significant, but he cannot use an accelerant. When the experiment okay. is aired on BBC, what do we see? and What does the viewer see? It sees John DeHaan pouring a liter of gasoline on a pig. Bad experiment. That's an accelerant. Bad, bad experimental methodology. That's an accelerant. Thank you. Yeah. Um, none of our cases involve an accelerant. Okay. John did three other experiments after that. Two of them um, produced fires that had, had to be extinguished. Okay. Using pigs as the stand-in for a human body. That's a fair stand-in. We, we don't argue that. Mm -hmm. The experiment that you're showing now aired on the Learning Channel in 2003 in a, in a program called Spontaneous Combustion. We were on that program. John DeHaan was part of that program. In this experiment that John is beginning to conduct, he took 12 candles, a fistful of candles okay. to replicate, to represent a human body. He wrapped them in cloth, laid them on a chair, and lit them. Now, our first critique of this is, does anyone really believe that a fistful of wax candles is a true representation of the human body? We would argue, no, it is not. But this is a lab, uh, a world-renowned forensic fire expert in a lab coat telling you that he's doing what needs to be done to disprove SHC. Is this this uh, was that the candle that the one that just this is the, the human, the human candle, candle theory? theory right you you take an external okay. ignition source in this case a a um, barbecue grill igniter or a match mm -hmm. or a bunsen burner or a cigarette ideally you add some alcohol to the human body and and you're going to end up with Mrs. Reeser's single foot and a few pieces of calcine vertebrae that's the argument for the human candlewick theory. Okay. In the experiment that you're showing now to your listeners, at the end of the experiment, if you're watching this on TLC, John DeHaan is standing outside the burn chamber saying, look, localized chair in the fire, the fire had, had gone out, 
you've got a localized fire, no surrounding combustible damage, ergo, I have just proven that SHC doesn't happen. End of mystery. What TLC did not show, but what we know to be absolute incontrovertible fact is this. Between the picture of John DeHaan igniting the fistful of candles on the chair and John DeHaan standing outside the burn chamber saying, look, localized fire, put itself out, no mystery. What actually happened is that the burn chamber was within seconds of full room flashover. The chair was oh. a roaring inferno. Okay. John DeHaan knew this. And yet he stood there at the end of his experiment and lied to the viewing audience. If you have okay. to lie about the failure of your experiment by calling it a success, what is your merit as a scientist to begin with? And you have no right. credibility whatsoever Absolutely to say not. that the research that we have done has no merit itself. Exactly. And this is the we thing, had, but because that's that's a phenomena besides the uh, the 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 body basically being burned to ashes is that nothing around it per se has been burned precisely Very that few. is one of the distinguishing factors of this phenomenon is the localization of what appears to be an incredibly high heat fire and mm -hmm. yet surrounding combustibles that are much more easily burned have much lower ignition points than does the human body those items escape unsinged or barely touched at all and he and what came of it that that uh did you ever go back and say hey <laughs> or or that was it it was televised and hey this was a, a successful experiment so this thing of people just catching fire that that's that doesn't really exist In we other words, we have the we have we have the video proof of john dehan's lie and for 25 years we annually taught fire science at local community college here in Harrisburg uh -huh. to a lot of very skeptical uh, fire students until we got to this particular point in our presentation. And the instructor of that course, Don Conkle, who re now retired as Harrisburg's fire chief, was absolutely blown away. Um, up, up to that point, he had used Mr. DeHaan's textbook in his for oh, his wow. fire students. Um, okay. Mr. Conkle decided at that point he could not trust John DeHaan and, and removed the book from, from the uh, curriculum and replaced it with a different author's textbook. Uh, we, we can honestly say that the firefighters themselves, the students to whom we showed this information, were themselves taken aback. Um, for someone of, of Mr. DeHaan's reputation and standing in the fire service community to outright lie about the failure of his experiment um, is frankly beyond our comprehension. But it speaks to the psychology of this phenomenon itself in that it raises so many profound, deeply disturbing questions to people who think they know everything there is to know about fire behavior right. and fire science. That it is easier for, sadly, many of them to ignore the evidence that we try to present to them and instead either run away from it, which has happened, or lie about it, or fabricate evidence and pass it off as fact, which has also happened. This is done. This is being done by people who go on television in lab coats, um, seems to be the, the uniform of authenticity, or by people who are, who are well known in, in the scientific skeptical field of inquiry. Um, they are willing to fabricate evidence and pass it off as fact rather than admit to there being a bona fide real life. Well, it's, all, it's, it's, it's all about the ego, Larry, when your it ego. Is. Yeah. You know what? <clears throat> it wouldn't be the first time that ego gets in the way of real science. How's that? Because you're you were so absolutely correct. Um, that reminds us of a uh, we had Chinese dinner a couple of weeks ago, and, and a fortune cookie that came with the meal was this proverb inside the cookie: "Quote: He who is afraid of asking is ashamed of learning." We thought that was a wonderful um, yes absolutely. little thought that that certainly applies to many of the um, naysayers in, in the field that we're sharing with your audience this evening. Um, we've had fire inspectors, fire investigators, um, 
usher us out of their office after we showed them photographs and ask them to explain from their professional point of view to us as a lay investigator, how mm -hmm. these fires can be explained. Um, we've had them run away from us down at the National Fire Academy, the inspectors uh, or the instructors. Uh, we had one instructor, one inspector in Philadelphia um, literally tell us that we will never forget this, quote, if I encountered a fire scene like you're showing me happen to Helen Conway or to Dr. Bentley, what I would do is this. I'd go out, get drunk, and forget about it. <laughs> it's like, He's you know, entitled to do that. But sure. Yeah. my God, you shouldn't then be a professional firefighter in the city of brotherly love. You know, find another profession. Yeah. Um, yes. We're trying to understand this because this to us is a real weird, bizarre, but also incredibly fascinating subject to explore and to yes. try to figure out. At best, we've been able to document it better than we believe anybody else has been able to do. Um, the photographs of Dr. Bentley would never be known to the public had not we doggedly pursued the case. Uh, there's a similar case up in um, upstate New York that happened in 1986 to George Mott, a retired firefighter, meticulously careful about fire in his home, and yet he burned himself to powder Lying on his bed, he burned through the mattress, through the floorboards below the bed, and into the crawl space below. He, too, had to have his asses shoveled out of the crawl space, much as Mrs. Reeser was shoveled out of her apartment. Let this me ask you. Uh, and I'm sorry, what did this gentleman do for a living? He was a retired firefighter. <laughs> okay. I'm just Very cautious, very meticulous about anything right, in, his, right. in his home that, that possibly might be a fire hazard. Mm -hmm. What he left behind was in this photograph, we have shown this photograph to those students that we taught for 25 years. And in that 25 year period, we think we had one student who could actually identify the body part that George Mott left behind in his bed. The arrows point to it. The upper arrow on the right is pointing to the toes of Mr. Mott's right foreleg. Oh. The left arrow is pointing to where the kneecap should be. Mr. Mott left behind in his bed one half of one leg, much as Dr. Bentley left one half of his leg in his bathroom floor. At the other end of the bed was Mr. Mott's head that we were told by a firefighter who knew Mr. Mott. The uh -huh. head had shrunken to the size of a grapefruit. Now, where did we hear that before? With yes. the Reeser case. With the Reeser we have three case, cases yes. where it has been said that the human head shrank ex in ex extraordinarily shrank in size. Again, this is not supposed to happen in any conventional fire scene. Uh, this is George Mott's uh, cabin home in, outside of Crown Point, New York, which is outside mm -hmm. of Ticonderoga in up, upstate eastern New York. Tar you know, another combustible environment. Um, this whole structure should have been burned down. Uh, it right. was not. We stood in we stood in Mr. Mott's bedroom again with being six feet in height. We could touch the seven foot ceiling above Mr. Mott's bed. Not a scorch mark on it. That's incredible. That's incredible. Again, no odor of burned flesh. So once again, we have either the the abs absence, complete absence of noxious burned mm -hmm. human tissue, or a sweet redolent perfume like smell. Well, there in, uh, in in recent cases, with have they been able to? I guess because now they have better scientific methodology or equipment. Have they found anything in more recent cases after they've studied what's left of the person, as far as chemical? Not not. I'm not saying accelerant, but any any something weird. Yeah. Uh, we have a case from 2013 in Oklahoma where we had the the medical examiner's report. Um, there mm -hmm. was nothing in the report that we recall that would lend any insight or ideas into how that victim burned so completely. In a case okay. from Bolingbroke, which is outside of Chicago, that happened Thanksgiving weekend in 1979 to Beatrice Oski, a fair amount of her body was left intact in her chair. Her lower legs were intact, um, and there was enough body left that it could be autopsied. Um, okay. The fire chief and the fire marshal both told us that the results of the autopsy was that there was not one drop of blood left in the tissues of Mrs. Oski. 
when the body was for, when the fire was first discovered, her son told us that the room smelled like hickory incense. Oh um, boy, that's that's wow. She that's also unusual. was a smoker, but once again, we're, we're, we're up with this quandary, where if there's an external known ignition source, uh -huh. how can a body burn so completely in such a short period of time? Um, Aside from the witness cases, the, the, the fatal case where we have been able to lock down the time parameter is the case of Mrs. Helen Conway, another Pennsylvania case. And another case that had, to, had we not doggedly pursued it would be lost to history. No one would ever know this photograph existed. In Let me ask you, and this is, this is the, this again, this is how, just real quick. How did you find out about the case? Was it you just were doing research and all of a sudden you came across it? Here, here's here's the Conway. Yeah, this is an interesting story. Um, okay. Glad you asked. Um, we were given opportunity to be, to our knowledge at the time, the only non-firefighter professional who was granted access to attend the advanced arson classes at the Pennsylvania Fire Academy. Okay. We were in the classroom, and at the end of the, the uh, classwork, the instructor, Buzz Treebold, said, I've just received in the mail a photograph of what some people say is spontaneous human combustion. It's this lady who was burned up in a chair. And our, our immediate thought was, oh, this is the research case. He's just learned about it. So he passed, the, the instructor was passing the photographs okay. around the room. And we're expecting to see the photograph of Mrs. Reeser when it gets to our hands. And we're looking at this photograph that you're showing to your audience. And we're saying, uh -huh. obviously, this is not Mrs. Reeser. There's two legs. Whereas yes. Mrs. Reeser left behind one foot. Okay. When the class was dismissed, we rushed up to Mr. Treebold, introduced ourselves, and said, who, when, where, how, why? His answer, all I know is that it happened somewhere in southeastern Pennsylvania. He had no date, he had no name, he had no fire department jurisdiction, only Southeastern Pennsylvania. Well, if your audience doesn't know, Southeastern Pennsylvania is Philadelphia, the biggest okay. city in Pennsylvania. Millions of people, how do we find this? Several months later, we had the opportunity to sit down with Dr. Wilton Krogman, the forensic anthropologist involved in the, in the Reeser fire sat down mm -hmm. in his office to talk to him about his career as a forensic anthropologist and finally to get him to talk about his involvement in the Reeser case, which he was quite reluctant to do. At the end of that interview, he said, Larry, I just got this envelope, which has a photograph that might be of interest to you. It was the photograph that you're showing your listeners. The envelope had a dress on it. We wrote to the address and a couple of weeks later, we heard from the fire marshal for Upper Darby Township, who took this photograph and 11 others. That's how we found out about the Conway case. We sat down with the fire chief, Paul Haggerty, you see in the insert there. Right. We sat down with his uh, assistant fire marshal. And then we sat down with Bob Meslin, the fire photographer in 1964, who took the photographs and later, become, later became fire marshal for Upper Darby Township. With those three senior fire officials, sitting down with them and going over all the details that they knew about this remarkable fire scene, we can tell you this. From the time that Mrs. Conway was known to be alive in her second floor sitting room at this house in Upper Darby Township on a Sunday morning in November 1964, until the fire department got notification of a fire that they responded to within minutes, uh -huh. From the time that she was known to be alive until the time that the fire department arrived at a fire scene where there was no fire to extinguish is 360 seconds, six wow. minutes. There is not a fire professional anywhere that we have interviewed and shown this photograph to. And this includes John DeHaan involved in that. Phony so you were, you, th this was. You can wow. explain this. I, I can imagine the. The fire, I imagine, how do these fire departments, how do they, like, I know they all write reports on what, especially when it involves somebody dying. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> who, who wants to sign off on that report? 
Uh, we, we, we love your chuckle, and it's been a source of great frustration as well as amusement for us at times. Um, because in in the Oski case from Illinois, we were told that the the police department actually went, tried to sweep the ashes literally under the carpet. It was the fire department that refused to accept that this was an accidental smoking mishap event, and and was able and was willing to sit down with us and pursue it at great depth. So they were open-minded about it, in other words. Yeah, it's incredibly difficult to to locate these fires to begin with, as you might imagine. Um, based on what we've told you has been the response of the Philadelphia fire inspector, for example, this will be written off as a smoking mishap, and the photographs will be buried and never released to the public. And in the certificate of death in Pennsylvania for Dr. Bentley, officially, Dr. Bentley died by asphyxiation. Legally, that would be defensible in the court because that's what the death certificate says. However, to determine asphyxiation, a medical examiner needs a trachea, a throat, a mouth, or lungs. None of those existed for Dr. Bentley, nor did they exist for Mary Reeser, nor did they exist um, for George Mott. And George Mott's death certificate also says that officially he died by asphyxiation. I was about so, to, you know, that's a very good question. What did they put on that death certificate as the cause of yeah. death? Interesting. Cause of death was asphyxiation compounded by attendant fire damage and burning to 90% of the body is the determination officially for Dr. Bentley's demise. 90% burning of the body? No, as the deputy coroner John Deck told us, it's more like 99%. And again, because I always thought of, our, of our, asphyxiation as somebody yeah. where they find the body, but the person's dead. And basically they say they were overcome by the smoke and then they, you know, they asphyxiated. Yeah. But yeah. There's no body. All right. Yeah. You, 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 can, you, you can look at the trachea. You can look at the esophagus and find mm -hmm. some particles. Okay. They were alive when the fire began or if there's no soot in the trachea, the person was exactly. dead. Exactly. Exactly. Simple. Good for right, which is, by the way, murder scenes that they try to cover up. That's how sure. they determine it. If there's no smoke or anything inside the lungs, they'll say, okay, this person was dead when the fire started. And there goes that theory of they died by asphyxiation. Precisely. It's it's simple forensic science. Should work. Yeah. But when it comes to this specific subject that we're chatting with you about today, mm -hmm. all that common sense seems to, in most cases, get tossed out. and the blinders go on the eyes. One of our naysayers, Mark Benecki, well-known forensic biologist, says that mm -hmm. SHC cannot happen, does not happen, is impossible because, according to him, there is no known case in which internal organs are burned more completely than our external body parts. On that basis, SHC, he says, cannot happen. That's fine. But then what do you do with Mr. Mott, Mrs. Reeser, Dr. Bentley, none of whom left behind a heart, a lung, a pancreas, a liver, or any other internal organ, but they did leave behind external body parts, half of a leg, a foot. Uh huh. So right. again, Mark Benecki knows this. Because he has seen our research, he has seen the photographs, and yet he persists in this myth that SHC is impossible because internal organs are always left behind at these fire scenes. No, they are not. No, so far from what you've shown me, it's all just the, if you're lucky, like a foot, half a foot, a leg. Mm -hmm. That's it. I'm going to ask it's, you it's, in these old. I'm going to I'm going to segue real quick off of this. In okay. these, and I know because it sounds like you've done so much extensive um, research into this. In these, I'm not talking more recent. When I mean recent '60s, were these really old ones? Did you, did you ever get um, explanation where somebody thought it was either a cult, like witchcraft, or God struck them down, or anything like that? Like, did you ever come across any explanation on that? You know, in other words, science was didn't figure on it. It was like the wrath of God, you got struck down, or somebody, you know, uh, somebody d d put a curse on you kind of deal. In the 1700s, yes. Um, uh, the abstinence movement in particular latched onto 
this flaming fate was the wrath of God coming down. Oh upon my God! Immoral, the temperance. Souls. Yes, yes. They actually this they, they invoke oh they, they, they accept that this is a reality, but they put that spin that coloration on it. Oh um, my God, that's great! So I'm you, sorry, you, I'm laughing you, because it was like. <laughs> It's okay. The teetotaler we, we laugh, said. We laugh, we laugh too. We laugh too. You have to find some humor in this some, somewhere. Yes, yes, yes. Um, glad we both found it. Yeah. Um, if you're a drunken old sot, um, this was divine vengeance, God's wrath coming down on your sorry drunken head. Um, so you don't <laughs> want to burn up? Don't fired. drink. That was the argument. That is incredible. That's funny. That is, you know, because that's like, and I, I imagine there was people that were like, oh my God, what? You know. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, you were saying that Benecki, he's he absolutely knows that you know that the what he's that his theory is not really accurate because of that's not what's left of he, victims of he, human combustion. Yeah, he 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 knows about our research. We actually sat down with 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 Mark in a bar in Belgium when we did a program together for um, Nat Geo. Um, okay, he knows the Bentley photograph. His counter to that is, well, if you had another photograph from a different angle, you would see the body part. You would see the internal organs. It's just that this clever, conniving photographer picked the one angle that doesn't show the internal organs. Well, we have a second photograph of Dr. Bentley that we have yet mm -hmm. to publicly release other than to the firefighters that we instructed at the uh, at the college arson fire courses that we taught. The second photograph of Dr. Bentley's fire scene is taken from a completely different angle and you will not find a single organ in it either. The organs and did not exist. Every first responder we spoke to that we could find and man, we hunted, we tried to hunt them all down who, was, who had any involvement in Dr. Bentley's death. Not a single one of them ever mentioned, ever hinted at, ever alluded to seeing an internal organ right at the fire scene. I'm, I'm thinking, yeah, well, the fire the department would issue a report, the ME, if there was something, would note it. I mean, besides a yes. photograph is yeah. what I'm saying. Yeah. There would be a report, yeah. a written report saying this is what we found. We examined and we found whatever, like you said. So it's, yeah. it wouldn't just be photographic or lack thereof that, that you're going to base like the uh the combustion theory on yeah especially something like the, this type the, of case yeah, yeah. In, in the bentley case to our knowledge there was no coroner's report just the death certificate oh um, really i wonder why yeah um don't pennsylvania at that time may not have required it thing okay Laws were fairly loose back in the day uh, in Pennsylvania, uh -huh. in this area. Um, Countersport is a small town, um, not a big city. Okay. Um, all right. But the, the testimony we got from all the first responders coincides with and supports the photographic evidence. The photographic evidence supports the first responders. Uh, and that's what we go on. Um, if the responders had said something completely contrary to what the photographs depict, we'd be mm -hmm. having a lot of questions, questioning credibility, authenticity of one or the other. What would... Um, we don't. We don't need to do that. In, 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 the, uh, in the cases that you have access to this information, and I know I asked you this, but I'm going to, as far as commonality, anything as far as the weather? Any, any type of weather pattern? No. Most, again, it was argued... Um, in the 17 and 1800s that the cases also occurred in, in, in the winter months, you know, fireplaces, mm -hmm. you know, drop candles, right. all that good stuff for an external ignition source. Um, looking at the database that we have as a whole, which now con contains about 500 cases that fit the construct, the definition, the concept of SHC, um, we found no common factor in terms of weather or meteorology. Okay. Um, all right. You know, I'm, 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 I'm still going around. I, I, you know, for you, it's, but for me, I'm going around like this is what, you know, what is, what is the, the tr trigger, I guess is what I'm looking for. What is, what is it that causes this to like, and obviously these people are sitting in their home. Um, how can I say not doing anything risky, you know, not, not, I'm not walking, I'm not standing under a tree, you know, in a thunderstorm kind of deal. 
and why is it that yeah. it happens? Yeah, this is all you, you just triggered memory. Um, Roy Sullivan holds the world's record for being struck by lightning and surviving. Okay. I think the number is seven times. What? And yet he like, never he never burned up from all these lightning strikes like mm -hmm. Dr. Bentley did or Mary Reeser did. And in fact, lightning strike victims, we've spoken to some of them, their burns are quite different from the, the subject that we're, we're describing to you uh, today. Um, How does one survive seven lightning strikes? That's incredible. <laughs> that, that is a wonderful question in and of itself, yeah. Roy Sullivan is, is, is truly another mystery uh, of human biology to have been struck seven times and survived seven times. Um, in fact, one time um, he wasn't struck, but his wife who was near him was almost hit by lightning. Um, oh. So it seemed that he was clearly attracting. Um, right, I was gonna say, it sounds discharge. like there's something yeah. that's attracting. And, and, and what enabled him to survive and, and not be fried to a crisp um, mm -hmm. is quite astonishing. Um, yes. We, yes. as we said, we do not believe these fires are caused by an oxidizing type of combustion fire or blaze. Um, we look at bioelectricity. We look at things more arcane like quantum physics and mm -hmm. Kundalini. Um, we obviously we've looked at geophysics with the fire lane concept. Uh, we've considered things from cosmology and astrophysics. Um, Okay. States of consciousness, the attitude, the emotional behavior of, of the individual, all these things okay. we have to consider at this point because we, as we said earlier, have been unsuccessful in identifying a single mechanism or a single set of factors common to all the victims. Okay. And again, this is, and from what you're saying, there is no common uh, not not what caused it, but when you look at besides the the ones that you said in Great Britain that follow that line, is there anything about the people in and of themselves that they're like in something? Not re not because they're related, but something about whether it's well. Now you said that's like fifty fifty as far as gender. So mm -hmm. forget the thing where one you know women versus men, um, age. Anything like that? That that does yep. nothing. Nope. <laughs> okay. yep. Interesting. We we we've looked we've looked for commonality again. We you know the cases from the seventeen and eighteen hundreds, even the early nineteen hundreds. We never get this information about medications, about right now it's personality different. profile types, about lifestyles in general. Yes. Um, mental attitudes emotional attitudes that's that is something that even to this day is not recorded by fire departments when they are mopping up after a fatal fire scene um well it's so you, we you almost that. think that they're they're, they're not going to ask those types of questions though yeah. you see what i'm saying they're just going to report oh, on what they find and yep. that's it the facts and that's it they're not going to ask like you know something like that as far as you know what maybe the person you know unless even then you know, medications, it's like, all right, what what kind of medication is going to make you burst into flame? Mm -hmm. As far as I know of, there's no such thing, I hope. But, yeah. <laughs> we hope too. Yeah. There, yeah. There'd be a mega, mega lawsuit pending if there is one. But yeah, we right. It's like, um, has, how about, I'm going to ask you this, any familial burnings where families or relations experience the same thing? In SHC, not that we recollect at this mm -hmm. moment. Um, okay. You're getting more into the, the, the poltergeist type of fire phenomena, looking at that angle. And we have spoken to some families that have experienced poltergeist fires, um, okay. objects, and in, in a few rare cases, actually clothing of the victim clothing of residents in poltergeist fire households has caught fire. Um, okay. But we, we, we have not been able to make a connection between the classic poltergeist spirit right. type mm -hmm. fire phenomena events with spontaneous or sudden human combustion events. 
And those the, the the thing with the the fire poltergeist is it the same thing where they have usually an adolescent in the household? Is that one of the things that's found? Usually, usually yes, not always, but generally that okay. is the case. Um, we looked in one case in Warncliffe, West Virginia, back in the early 1980s. We actually went mm -hmm. to the the scene. We met with the fire officials involved in trying to figure out that. <laughs> baffling bevy of blazes um, okay. was focused on a minister's family. Gene Clemens was the minister. A minister's family? Oh boy. Mm -hmm. Minister's family. Um, sadly, we got there the day after the last open blaze combustion event happened. But the okay. firemen told us that they were, um, it's a long story. Uh, mm -hmm. We're just picking out a couple of salient points. Um, they had responded to the the, the house several times they had first disconnected the power meter at the house then they okay. disconnected the power at the at the utility pole kept coming back with calls for new outbursts of fires um one that comes to mind they were running down the hallway in, in mr clemens house they ran past the bathroom the bathroom was perfectly intact because they were headed to the Bed, a child's bedroom at the end of the hallway because a mattress had begun to burst into flame. As they were picking up the flaming mattress to take it out the hallway and outside, as they passed the bathroom a second time, they looked in and noticed that bath towels on a towel rack in the bathroom was were now ablaze. Clearly, in that few seconds of going past the bathroom and coming back past the bathroom, nobody had gone into the bathroom and, and lit the right. towels on there fire. Was no, there was nobody there that... that, that... Right. There, were, there was there was an outlying building, cement block building that was padlocked, had no power to it. They saw smoke coming out of the eaves of the building. When they unlocked the door, they discovered um, that a artificial Christmas tree had caught fire and had partially melted in the locked cement block building. We actually have part of that Christmas tree in our collection. Um, mattresses, chairs, clothing would burn. Um, the Clemens family was trying to rescue property from the house. They put clothing in one of their vehicles. And as they're driving away from the vehicle down the road, um, they passed the fire truck coming back to respond to another fire call at the house. The uh, clothing of the van caught fire. I mean, it was just a bizarre bevy of blazes. Um, How never long got did they experience this? Yeah. Um, was it just days or? You're testing our recollection. We think it went for about a week and a half or two weeks. Okay. Don't hold us to that. No, no, but that's um, a pretty long time when you've got fires busting out yeah. in your house. In in meeting with the fire chief, um, we asked if there were any other unusual fires happening in his dur jurisdiction around the same time. And guess what? There were. We ran up on a fire tower with a topo map, plotted all these other fires that he had problems explaining on the topo map and look for patterns. And what we discovered that um, there's about, I think nine blazes that we plotted, nine or 10 blazes that we plotted, not just at the Clemens household, but elsewhere in the vicinity of Warncliffe. And those, all those fires could fall on the perimeter of two circles, each one a mile in diameter. Really? Interesting. Really. And in the same type of situation where these fires were just happening and they couldn't figure out how? The the other fires around Warncliffe were not as dramatic, not as intense, mm -hmm. not as numerous as the collection of fires that befell the Clemens property. Um, but again, the fire department said we, we had no explanation of why this match ignited at this location or this light bulb exploded at this other location and so on well we did have the opportunity to experience even though we missed by one day the last open blaze combustion was we, we were called out with the fire department to another home um, that fell in one of these mile, mile in diameter circles and could feel a hot spot in the mattress at that residence a hot spot that moved around inside the mattress you could hold your hand as we did above the mattress and feel heat at that spot and that spot moved around no open so they, 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 they in other words that, that's incredible that they, mm -hmm. i can imagine these these uh this fire department must have been <laughs> figuratively and literally pulling their hair out 
Yeah, they were bumfuddled. They had they had no no explanation. All they could do was respond again and again and again to a fire call. Did everything that they knew to do to eliminate mm -hmm. a potential fire source, right. but their knowledge could not preclude these fires from continuing continuing to spontaneously ignite. And, and then, then it, they did, it, did they all stop Peter out at the same time, more or less? And then about the same time, yeah, the, the phenomenon ended and, you know, they went about their normal business of responding to trash fires and clothing fires and so on, all of which had conventional, easily understood explanations, but not for the fires that happened at the, at the Clemens household. When the Clemens family left that house, did they keep experiencing this or was it just when they were in that one house? Wonderful question, and we're going to uh, wave off on that. We we don't know the okay. answer. We suspect okay. had it followed them, we would have heard about it and been called right. out to another location. That did not happen. But with, okay. as, as we said throughout this interview, we try to approach the subject scientifically and intellectually, honestly. So we did not follow up to actually confirm whether or not the phenomenon persisted in pursuing the family. We just do not know. Right, right. And the reason why I ask is, you know, poltergeist activity sometimes will follow a family around. In other words, when they relocate, they still get the phenomena occurring, whatever, you know, however it manifests. So in other words, they, they realize I can't outrun this. And ex exactly like you said, it will stop just as suddenly as it started. Sometimes just one day it stops or it peters out. And that's why I, I asked that question. Uh, so, again, that thing about is it the location, 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 like in real estate? Interesting, interesting. And, and what you described where they had actually turned off the electricity. Mm -hmm. In other words, they were trying to anything that they could say, oh, this is occurring because what a short circuit and the wiring of the right. house, you know, anything. Yeah. And it, it was said when, yeah. when 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 Gene Clemens told us what initially happened at the house, there were there were electric blue sparks coming out of wall outlets, catching things what? on fire like drapery, and so the, the you know the fire department would think, yeah, it's an electrical system. We're going to kill the power at the meter, and they did that, mm -hmm. and then they went to the pole and killed the power there, and the phenomena continued. So clearly, it was not 120 volt electric related. It was something else. And, and, and then you're thinking, okay, is this is this actually? Oh, here we go, traveling through the electrical um, wiring. And and I'm gonna real quick. This was many years ago. I was this is I was in South Florida, and I was I was doing something, and all of a sudden it wasn't. By the way, the weather wasn't really bad, but a tornado, which is unusual for South Florida, touched down. And I'm coming down the street, and all of a sudden I'm looking through the yards. And I see things flying in the air, you know, and you're trying to like somehow like figure it out. Bottom line, this thing was coming. I had to put the brakes on and back up. But I saw this blue light inside that tornado or that electricity you, that you never, I've never seen that light, and that, that color anywhere else except in that moment. It was a very electric blue light. I know it's a very unusual one of a kind blue light. Okay. That I saw and makes me think, you know, is this the same? It's something like, how can I say this? Produced by nature. How's that? Mm -hmm. That's what I that what I saw when I looked at that and I put my car in reverse and got out of the way of that little mini tornado coming across the yards. Um, but it was it was very unusual. Like I said, I've never I've never seen that color like bursting inside the tornado as you know as it was cutting across. Um, and then again, that's, I guess, but is this something that's produced by nature, you know, versus man-made somehow? How's that? I don't know. It works for us. It sounds like um, ball lightning, um, which again, when we were beginning our education in, in this lifespan was something that mainstream science poo-pooed. Doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. You know, these are old wise tale superstition, which has also been said of right. SHC. And now it's perfectly acceptable in mainstream science. And as we said, they can create it, it can be created in a laboratory under control controlled conditions. The problem with our subject that we're focusing on right now is that whatever is the mechanism that causes this phenomenon is not something that we believe can be taken to a laboratory and reproduced under controlled conditions because we still don't okay. understand what those conditions are. 
Yeah, this right. Is and that, that, that's the problem it. right there, which I think happens in a lot of cases where, like you said, it cannot be reproduced in laboratory. So that, and, and because of that, it's discounted. It's like, oh, you can't reproduce this in a lab. Well, then I guess that doesn't exist, you know. No. Scientists tend to like things that they think they can understand and then mm -hmm. and based on their understanding, reproduce and confirm or refute. Um, but that can that, that involve that's the scientific methodology. Um, yes. this this doesn't lend itself to that. This is truly spontaneous. Um, we don't know when it's going to happen. We can't predict exactly where it will happen, although the fire lane idea gives us some places to look and to suspect. Um, but it's easier, as we said repeatedly uh, to you, Marley, that so many in mainstream fire science find this subject so distressing, so unnerving, mm -hmm. that it's easier to deny it and to debunk it. And this quote from Arthur C. Clarke is, is a right. gem. Um, in, a, in a show about the subject, he said, some cases seem to defy explanation and leave me with a very creepy and very unscientific feeling. If there's anything more to SHC, I simply don't want to know. And again, Mr. Clark is entitled to that viewpoint. We have no problem sure. with it. But we believe, as we think we've been able to show to you this today, that there mm -hmm. is clearly something more to the subject than not wanting to know about it. Let's figure this sucker out. Um, let's see if there are ways to prevent it from happening to people in the future, because this is an ongoing phenomenon. Um, because it was debunked in 2013, it's not going to stop it from happening this year or next year or to somebody. Sure. We said kind of um, facetiously, but perhaps not so much, that if this were to happen to the president of the United States, um, before a bank of microphones and cameras, suddenly science would say, oh, we've Absolutely. known about this all along. And oh yeah, this yes, is SHC right. and, and oh, no yeah, big deal. We, you know, this is how it happens. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, we're not there yet. Right. We're not there yet. Um, they can't, they as, can't. Uh, they, I, I, I want to say, I'm going to, I'm going to say this. I'm, I'm a very big believer in the scientific method and in science, mm -hmm. but sometimes it, it when you get hooked on that that's the only way to explain something and you and anything else is it doesn't exist or is not valid i think we, we you know we do ourselves a disfavor because just because you can't explain it scientifically doesn't mean it doesn't exist or it's possible we we so so concur with that statement marlene absolutely um Bob Meslin, the fire photographer, fire marshal in the Conway case, he told us, as so many other fire instructors have told us, and this is a direct quote from Bob, one of the prime prerequisites of an investigator is to have an open mind. Yes. We absolutely embrace that. We hope that pervades all the research that we have done on this subject and other Freudian phenomena that we've looked into. Um, because without an open mind, as you correctly say, you're locking out you're blocking, you're blinding yourself to a mm -hmm. lot of possibilities. And when sure. you're looking at something that seems not to make any common sense yes. and defies what you think you understand about the subject, if you don't have an open mind, you're going to remain oblivious to some possibilities that could be really revelatory and insightful. Not too far from where I live is the State Fire College. I wonder what stories they would say, <laughs> because sometimes, you know, and the reason why I say this, and this I think happens in all these fields, there's these internal stories that will circulate. Like, but what you said, if you ask them out and out, they'll say, I don't know. But amongst themselves, hmm. certain stories circulate, some even about this subject, that it's like, off the record, I'll talk about it, but I'm never going to admit to it because then I'll become like, you know, the laughing stock or, hey, even now. Even when things are a little bit more open-minded about unusual occurrences, they'll be like, no, 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 I don't know what you're talking about. But that happens, I think, a lot. Yeah, yeah. It, it does happen. We, we have seen that. We have personal stories that would, would affirm what you've just said. And it call, recalls 
going back to the Weezer case, when we went down to St. Pete, uh, August of 2013, to do some additional research to get some more photographs, we stopped by the fire department. Now, this was this is still the most famous single fire fatality in the jurisdiction of the St. Pete Police Department, Mrs. Weezer's death in 1951. And yet we discovered that a lot of the current members of that department, including fire officers, have mm -hmm. no conscious knowledge of this amazing fire that happened in the, in their jurisdiction, just as a as a historical cur curiosity, we think they would all know right. about Mrs. Reeser. Right, it wasn't that long ago, and and yet you know. Um, yeah, you would think they would have a couple it, of pictures up, yeah. like somewhere in the firehouse, mm -hmm. like hey, because uh, just this, we never we it. never figured this one out. Right. Yeah, it doesn't happen. Um, which again is is one way that this subject is so easily dismissible. Um, the history yes. of it has has been lost to many in the current scientific, medical, and fire science communities. And if you don't know your history, um, it's easy to deny what you don't know. I'm going to ask you real quick before I forget. That case that you said that the, the 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 two women that they were in the same bed, one incinerated, and did anything happen to the other woman? No, no burns, nothing. According to the the uh, original source that we discovered in a dusty volume at the College of Physicians in Philadelphia, the answer is no. Wow, I don't understand because you. I, I mean, and and, the, and again, I'm going to come back to my own personal experience that you just, if you come close to a fire, just getting close to it, you feel the heat, all right? In other words, you don't have to be standing in the fire to be burned by the fire. How's that? Because the heat intensifies as you get closer to it. And um, yeah, I, I can't, even now, I, I finished uh, putting a, you know, burning a, even now it was like, five days ago if you get close to my burn pile which i have very big logs you still feel the heat mm -hmm. coming off of it sure. and that was five days ago yeah and, and that's one of the arguments that we hear from the naysayers larry you don't understand fire doesn't generate a lot of radiant lateral heat it burns upward well again we, we've given you several cases where there was no evidence right. of the fire heat rising upward <clears throat> and it doesn't radiate outward very far most of this is towards the internal part of the body and downward it seems if you have a moment we'll give you the exact quotes yes. from the uh, case that we just talked that you just raised again um going yes. back to our notes this is from our book of blaze on november 10 1731 a fierce but localized fire had ravaged a 68 year old female in vitry a remote village in Haute-Saône, france the woman who lived alone fell and struck her head uh Sorry, we got the wrong we got the wrong clip here. Um, we'd have to dig deeper for that other one. Sorry, never mind. No, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it because that what you explained, and it, it was enough that it was noted. How's that? Yeah, yeah. All right. It's not like now that you know everything. The, the newspapers and everything prints everything about everybody. About you know whatever. That that it seems so unusual that somebody took uh, took note of it. On, on, on that point, let us add this. A lot of these early cases were reported not by ignorant, uninformed, yes. stupid neighbor bystanders. They were reported by right. physicians. Um, yes. The case in Vitry that we started to quote was by a physician, Per Cron. Uh, the case that so fascinates you where the one body was burned, incinerated next to another person who slept through the ordeal um, of her bedmate, um, was we believe reported also by a physician, uh, people with medical training at least. Yes. Um, so these these are not happenstance, carelessly reported um, yes. hearsay. Yeah, they're the closest thing to a trained observer, if you want to call them that. And um, back then, also, th th which people don't realize, it's not like now that you call nine one one and you get transported. Back then, doctors would run mm -hmm. to the location, let's say in the house, yeah. you know. Uh, to, to, to aid or to, and even the police sometimes, if they found a deceased person, they would call, it was the doctor or coroner to come. And uh, and even then, very shortly, they would have what they call a coroner's inquest to determine, 
you know, cause of death. So they always relied a lot of times on the police and or a physician that had arrived to, to give them the information or their opinion of, you know, what caused the death. So I understand what you're saying, that this was not the guy next door. He says, well, you know, I think usually um, they were they were looking to people that had some type of education to to say what they saw or what they observed. You know, that kind of thing. Uh, a few of these, a, a very few of these cases have, have made it to mainstream medical literature. Um, one that comes immediately to mind happened in Aberdeen, Scotland in 1888. Um, the gentleman was found in the hayloft of a barn uh, looking intact, uh, clearly burned, but the whole body you could recognize, legs, the torso, the head was all there in the photograph that was taken and published in the British Medical Journal in 1888 and investigated by a physician, Dr. Mackenzie Booth. When the body was attempted to be picked up for removal from the hay loft of the barn, the hay, by the way, did not burn, the body of the victim, Mr. A.M., crumbled to powder when touched, so completely wow. dehydrated. Now, how does yes. a body completely dehydrate itself, surrounded by straw that is not burned? Exactly. You would have thought um, that barn would have gone up. There you go. There's there there, there was a talk about material for a fire to keep going. And it makes you wonder what is it about the body that is it, 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 what is the uh, what's it called what's the ingredient hmm. in that body. That it's like maybe once it's burnt, that's it. That it's over. It's like a flash, flash thing, and nothing else. That's so interesting. That is that. That's I've, I'm because I was aware of human combustion before. I've heard of the cases, but not with the information that you've given. As far as that, nothing else around it really was affected by what appears to be a very very high. Um, and and again, I'm gonna come back that people don't realize how much heat is necessary when bodies are cremated, yeah. how hot those crematoriums are uh, in we, order to reduce it to dust. Yeah, we, we, we've run some, some mathematical calculations to incinerate, to dehydrate a normal human adult weighing about 180 pounds requires mm -hmm. 34 million calories of heat energy. Wow. That's pretty sizable number and for and for yeah. quite a while it's not like you pop them in there and they're like and they're burned it, you, you got to put them in there for a bit uh yeah, as far yeah. inside the cremation chamber yeah. we we've, we've we've argued this to so many people who want to deny shc if it is so easy to burn a body by dropping a lit cigarette or match on a cadaver mm -hmm. as you would claim it to be by invoking the wick effect then why do crematorium owner operators spend $100,000 on a retort, on filtration equipment, on licensing fees, on a cremulator to grind up the bone yes. fragments? Yes. They wouldn't do that. They're business people. They would buy a pack of matches and a carton of <laughs> cigarettes and <laughs> light the cigarette go out, have a leisurely lunch, come back and it's scrape over. up the ashes and put it in the urn and give to the next of kin. They don't do that because they can't do that. As a matter of fact, I'm going to interject my, my little morbid story here. They have found that uh, some of these uh, servers, well, they call them, uh, basically, they're, they're, as a matter of fact, they are sometimes... Uh, they don't have their own crem crematoriums. Basically, they do the service. They pick up the body. Let's say they've been contracted. But as far as the, if the person or the family wants a cremation, they take them to a certain place that has the the cremation oven or whatever it is. And some of them have run out of money because of the cost involved. And, you know, later on they found, you know, there's been scandals about people, mm. not, you know, that they have found bodies that were supposed to be cremated that weren't. Uh, a couple right. of funeral homes have gotten in trouble. My point being that, yes, that it takes specialized equipment and there's a type of expense involved because it's not like you said, hey, go back out there and throw a match on the body. And then, hey, in a couple of hours, that's it. All you've got is dust. Right. Yeah. 
you know, we actually we actually identified to our knowledge the only person in this country perhaps in the world who is both a fire chief and a crematorium owner <laughs> he lives and works in new jersey all right we traveled to new jersey and sat down with the gentleman um he he commands a a a well-staffed well-equipped modern fire department in an upscale community in in new jersey and he owns and operates a crematorium okay. and we showed him the photographs that we've been sharing with your audience today mm -hmm. he had no idea as a fire chief that a body could burn itself like mrs reeser or dr bentley or george mott did to their bodies he had no idea as a crematorium owner operator that a body could burn so completely outside of a retort and even in a retort not so completely he was quite mystified and astonished that this phenomenon exists he did not know about it yes that you that, know that they, that's how restrictive problems. they um they even have to be so careful because now you know the uh, because of the heat uh, they have to take out any pacemakers or if there's mm -hmm. any metal in the person's body you know right. they have to remove it because they can't because of the high heat they can't incinerate because it'll as a matter of fact i think it just basically uh breaks down the, the the oven the heating agent so they have to make sure that they remove anything like like mm -hmm. uh that was metal inside a person this uh, is true. because of the high heat yes and people don't realize sure. that's why i'm saying yeah. that that to produce when you see those pictures of these people that all you've got is a, a shoe and you know a foot in a shoe it's like that's you know how much heat you have to have to do that to produce that mm -hmm. that's incredible that i that the that this can happen in a in a room you know out of nowhere no accelerant the house or the room doesn't burn down and nothing is left and they, I imagine people are being identified because, well, that's where they lived, and that looks like their foot. But otherwise, there's nothing left by yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. In 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 the in the Bentley case, uh, Don Don Gosnell, who discovered the fire scene, uh, thought initially he was looking at the leg of a mannequin on Dr. Okay. Bentley's bathroom floor until he got down close and examined it and realized it wasn't a mannequin leg; it was a human leg. Um, oh, man. A, We've had a couple cases moment. where the body is burned so badly that because there's just one extremity left that clearly is human, uh, that it can be determined that, yes, this whole pile of powder once was Mr. Mott or Dr. Bentley. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, it was claimed uh, in the Reeser case from Florida, from St. Pete, that she had been waylaid in her apartment, taken off premises, killed and burned off site. And then the ashes were brought back in and salted in her apartment, which makes no sense whatsoever. But that's how desperate the officials were back in 1951 to try to make sense of her fire scene. Um, Let me ask you, I'm going to ask you because I looked at one of the slides that you sent me, something mm -hmm. having to do with Jack Angel. Oh, okay, sure. This is a whole other subset of the phenomenon that our critics just absolutely despise us for broaching. But as we said, we follow the best evidence and where it takes us is where it leads us. Jack Angel is a subset of the phenomenon of spontaneous human combustion in that he is a survivor of partial SHC. Okay. We've sat down with Mr. Angel. We sat down with two of his attorneys. Uh, here is the basic story. Jack Angel was a traveling salesman in 1974. He used a motorhome as a traveling showroom. He had an appointment scheduled to meet with a potential client in Savannah, Georgia, uh, on a Tuesday morning, if memory serves, in 1974. He parked the motorhome outside of a Ramada Inn because the room that he had booked had been given to someone else. He spent the night in his motorhome, expecting to wake up the following morning to meet with his potential client. 
He did not awaken the following morning. According to him, he awakened several days later to discover that his right forearm was charred to the bone, burned black oh. from his fingers to his elbow. He had other injuries to his body of a burn nature to his chest, the nape of his neck, and around his groin. Disc in his spinal column had fused. He had difficulty walking thereafter. Nonetheless, he awakened, got dressed, feeling no pain, and exited the motor home, only to collapse and faint in the Ramada Inn. When Jack Angel regained consciousness, he found himself surrounded by a team of physicians at the Savannah General Memorial Hospital. Physicians are trying to figure out how their patient had been burned in the fashion that he was. We have the medical reports for Jack's treatment. He was diagnosed having burns, quote unquote, internal in origin. <laughs> we know no way to interpret that phrase other than that he burned from the inside out. We mentioned two attorneys in Atlanta. They took the case attempting to file a multi-million dollar, multi dollar lawsuit against the manufacturer of the motorhome in which Jack slept. They look for electrical faults. They look for water failures. They look for lightning strikes. They look for anything external that would have caused the injuries to Mr. Angel that could be attributed in some way to the motorhome. They came up empty handed. A week before trial, they pulled the case from the docket because they could not meet the burden of proof. They told us these were two very astute, very smart, very savvy attorneys who were looking for a multi million dollar return on their investment. They got none. As we said, the medical documentation from Jack Angel's treatment says that the burns were internal in origin. Jack is the first survivor of partial spontaneous human combustion that we had the pleasure to interview. We've now spoken to about two dozen others. Not everybody burns to powder in this phenomenon. It can be survived, but the mystery still remains. Why does it happen to a few people and not to so many others? What is the nature of the injury? What is the nature of the energy? that causes the body to smoke or to blister, if not completely burn itself to powder. And he, what happened? Did he lose his arm? I take it or? The arm, the, 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 the tissue of his right forearm was burned so severely that the visit, the medical team gave him a choice of two options. One reconstructive surgery, which is going to be prolonged, painful with no guarantee of success. The second option was amputation. Jack opted for amputation. Okay. I would think, and again, didn't they, w wouldn't it be difficult? Like, how can this one part of your body be so burnt, but then the rest of you, you know, because I don't know about the rest of him, because it sounds like there were certain parts of him that got very burnt, but there was, you would think he, he would have died, like he would have incinerated. Like, how does one part get spared and the other one burn so badly? That's a question that's going to have to be answered by somebody else or answered by <laughs> us when we get more insight. <laughs> right now, we have no answer to that. Is it, it is a fascinating anomaly and an intriguing mystery that's looking for a solution. I did our not know that there was that such that a our, thing as survivors yeah. of human combustion. Yeah. Wow. Our naysayers in the Jack Angel case say that, oh, Larry, you must realize that Mr. Angel scalded himself with hot water. Well, oh. these are not hot water scalding injuries that he had. He had internal damage to the body. And again, we're going to believe the medical professionals who treated his injuries rather than some Sarah sitting on a sofa couch somewhere guessing what had to have happened. Uh, we'll trust the physicians attending Mr. Angel when they say the burns were quote unquote internal in origin. Let it go. Figure it out. And what woke him up was not pain. He just woke up. Woke up. No pain. He, uh, he only experienced pain when he regained consciousness in the hospital. And then he, he told us that it was painful like you would expect a burn of such severity to feel. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And that's the thing that, again, and he was asleep, which is, asleep. yeah, makes you wonder, like, is there something that happens in that moment where a person is either asleep or close to falling asleep? Oh, God, the questions are endless. And I imagine you've probably had more than I could ever think of. 
Larry, this has been so absolutely fascinating. You were saying you mentioned something that you're, are you working on another book or an updated version of your book? What we are attempting to do now is to take individual cases, Mrs. Weiser, okay. uh, Dr. Bentley and others, and throw into a book devoted to each singular case, all the information, all the photographs that we've acquired in almost 50 years of documenting the subject. So okay. that at least what we've been able to acquire, and as we said, much of the many of the cases that we've put in our book ablaze would have been lost to history, would be lost to history had, had we not doggedly pursued the, the events, the cases, the photographs. So we don't want this information to be lost so that after our physical transition, somebody can come along and say, oh, that stupid Larry Arnold back then, he believed in this silly thing called SHC. He's a pseudoscientist. He's a mystery monger. There's nothing to this. No, the information that we have amassed will stand the test of time. It, it demands to be studied by perhaps someone smarter than we are, but at least we have done the legwork um, for a new medical mystery. Whether we get the Nobel Prize in medicine someday, we're not holding our breath, but we'd like to get it. It would be nice. <laughs> well, you know what? Maybe at some point, maybe there will be some type of explanation. You know, who knows? I mean, it's not something that's totally out of the realm, something, you know, there's so many things that, know, that are explained that 200 years ago were a total mystery. Like, how does that happen? And now we understand. Our our father, when we came out of college in the late 60s, 60s and we do some experimentations on energy fields, mm -hmm. he said, first, you're going to burn the house down, Larry. And secondly, there's nothing more to discover because everything that is known is already known. Now, that was before the day of the Internet, among other things. Um, a Pony uh -huh. Express rider in the early 1830s would say it's absolutely absurd to think that a package or a letter could be delivered from New York City to California in less than two day and two weeks ride. Just impossible. Can't be done. Things change. Knowledge yes. advances. Learning progresses if you have an open mind. And yes. someday learning to reflect on, on Bob Meslin's quote again, that you need to keep an open mind. Someday yes. somebody's going to figure out at least some of the cases that we've been able to document over the lifetime that we've spent looking into this subject. Um, maybe us. Well, no, this is this us, is the thing else. that that that's. And then they're going to look back and they go, "Oh man, all those close-minded so-called scientists that were like, <laughs> nah, I don't know," and you know that kind of thing. Like you get your vindication at the end of everything. But uh, you never know. You never know when you least expect it. But at the same time, I'm going to put in my two sons' worth because I say it. Life is interesting because of its mysteries. <laughs> well said. The universe is full, full of magical things, patient, patiently waiting for wits to grow sharper. And Absolutely. we hope we've sharpened the wits of your audience a bit yes. uh, during this discussion on this amazing, fascinating, wonderful. frightening, eerie subject. I know. Uh, it is <laughs> all of those things. <laughs> because really all my questions are like what do i avoid so that i don't become like a you know like don't go here don't do that whatever don't wear this don't be there no no answers there let me ask you larry what is your website for my podcast listeners if they want to get more information on this where sure. can they go to we we'd be love to explore the subject further with your listeners um questions comments possible leads on a new case please mm -hmm. get in touch with us the way to do that simply is to go to parascience.com uh, you'll find our contact information there the email address for this specific subject is real simple it's shc happens at gmail okay. Um, okay contact us with ideas suggestions and Best of all, if it's possible, a lead on a case that we don't know about. We were yes. spending our time, the money out of, out of our hip pocket. This is all self-funded research. Um, but it's something hey. that clearly has intrigued us, has captivated us, because we're not mystery mongering. The mystery right. is in the subject, in the evidence that this phenomenon produces. And it's crying out for serious study by mainstream science until that happens. At least it has us to pursue the subject right. and the mystery. Maybe you'll get a story about how Uncle Barney caught fire. And nobody, you know, <laughs> <laughs> the yeah. only ones that knew about it was a family to be like, okay, well, you know, because there's stuff we, like that. We, there's always stories yeah. like that. True. We we know that this this is, let us say this as we close down, this is a rare phenomenon. 
-hmm. If it were common, it would not be so easily dismissed and disbelieved. Having said right. that, we also know that there are cases that we have yet to discover. We've had some intriguing leads, but without enough information or detail to enable us to track them down. We got lucky with Mrs. Conway. Um, maybe right. one of your listeners will, will get us the information yeah. that we need Somebody to find. Somebody that works at a fire department case. also. Yeah. Yeah. Because sometimes it's, you, you would think, and sometimes again, you know, some of these departments are insulated as far as mm -hmm. weird stories. Mm -hmm. That the only ones that know about it are the guys that work there or in the town or or even in the time period. Because right. let's face it, 30 or 40 years ago, like what you found, the guys that were working there are have all retired. And if they didn't keep the story, and then every right. once in a while you'll get somebody yeah. to go, well, you know what? I heard this story that back in 59, mm. you know, this they went to this place and God, they only found somebody belt buckle or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Um, on that point, precisely, um, with the Bentley case, the the first responders, the people at the fire scene were so nonplussed, so disturbed by what they saw, they kept it to themselves. Mm -hmm. the, the front page news yes. story, two days after Dr. Bentley's transition, announcing his death and giving him a front page obit, did not provide any clues as to the true nature of the fire scene. Died unexpectedly. In, yeah. And we, we covered this case first on national television on the program That's Incredible in 1980. It just so happened that Dr. Bentley's son and his wife were watching that program. That is the first time Dr. Bentley's son understood and realized how his father had transitioned. Wow. Nobody in Cowdersport had told him the details of the fire scene. Can you imagine so this that? This was, his as own you say, son? a very insulated, very insulated, isolated subject that was not talked about. And as we said, yes. basically to this day, the details would not be known had we not doggedly discovered and pursued it. I can imagine. And I, I think that sometimes a lot of these that we're getting into the ego, they don't want to say we don't know. Because I would imagine that if they told his son, his son would be, but how can this happen? And what are they going to tell him? We just don't know. Yeah. You know, so it's like, okay, we'll just not go there. And we'll give the, the explanations, you know, that it was a pipe or a cigarette or whatever and leave it at that. Again, Larry has been absolutely wonderful to speak to you. I'm going to put a, a link to the in the credits of the show to your website. But uh, I'll be looking forward to speaking to you again so we could talk about this. This, this is fascinating. Beautiful. Thank you. This has been an, enjoy an enjoyable evening for us. Uh, you've been a great interviewer, wonderful questions, great enthusiasm. And um, we've hoped we've spurred some curiosity and yes. um, questions among Absolutely. your audience as well. Have Take at care. it. Thank you. Bye, Thank Larry. You, dear. Bye, sweetheart. Wow. Can <laughs> you tell I was trying to figure that one out? What, 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 what did they do or not do? So I'll make sure not to do or not do that or be at a certain place. Like what? When you can go. Psh. And um, and it, I, to me personally, I think it's fascinating because there is no explanation. I mean, you can, like what Larry's done, that you've collected all these stories, all these circumstances. And besides that linear thing in Britain, that has the higher number that that's interesting in and of itself, because think about it. You know, I think I was thinking when he, he brought that up, I was like thinking of ley lines, you know, ley lines, how certain things happen along certain ley lines uh, that even certain ancient structures are found along ley lines. But I'm thinking, wait, that's different. You know, if but people bursting into flame, that's like, yeah, make sure you don't live along this certain type of line, you know, because you could bust out, that again the when you read about and some of what he was describing the circumstances that exist before and after and even what you saw of those pictures you know as far as um what's left of these people you know you think how can this be how can um how can the nothing be left of a person?
person except the the shoe, their foot, or below the knee, or that lady where it's the two legs. All right. And they're right there, what you're looking at. That's that's Larry right there. Um you know that that uh that you're like I don't know, I'm one of these people that I, I'll I'll just go round and round with this because to me it's like um how does you know and, and, and I have to laugh because sometimes we we uh we look at things and we think that oh you know what if you know especially if, if it happened a while back oh I'd figure that one out how did that happen I'd let me tell you whether it was a few hundred years ago or more recently uh, there's still no explanation there's no how what's the what's the what I'm looking for there's no rhyme or reason all right and I think that's what that does a head number on me because I'm always trying to find what is the common denominator you know what what was it that all these people shared that of course somebody like Larry who's gone through you know done the basically he's dissected all these cases and looked at the background and looked at the circumstances and spoken to people and spoken to witnesses and you know in other words things maybe that weren't even written up in a report or in the newspaper article he's actually spoken to people who were there trying to see okay you know what I found that after all these years or I've speaking to all these people yeah, they're different, but they all had this one little thing going on. And again, you can't go back. Look at that. This lady's no, this was I'm sorry, this was Bentley. This was Dr. Bentley's foot with a slipper on. Um that you would think that you can't go back and ask these people that well, I'm wondering and I and I should have asked them about that gentleman, the Jack Angel that had partially incinerated did you feel anything different that day? I mean, it sounds like what? He fell asleep. Look at that. That one where he's got the legs. That's so weird. It's disturbing, but very weird. That that you want to ask them anything? What, did you wake up that day feeling a certain way in your body? Uh, I don't know. You have heart. Anything. Anything that that you could say, well, this is this is the... How can I say something that you felt in your body internally, but there's no way to go back and ask them this. And of course, this gentleman right there, which I didn't know until I actually asked him, I thought that this slide about Jack Angel was going to talk about another person that had died, you know, and no, he was a survivor, which that's, that's, in, I'm, that no. And, and then again, you ask yourself, why do some people totally like turn to dust and somebody like Jack Angel only partially? Was there something that interrupted it? Was there something that was missing in the body? Was it somebody that had drunk a lot of water? And by the way, I'm not going to go the, the, the temperance movement as in you're full of alcohol and that's why you burst into flame. I'm talking, what if you're one of these people that normally drinks a lot of water and maybe that's what saved you and maybe these other people that went they didn't drink that much water they drank water but maybe they they were dehydrated how's that i don't know i'm making stuff up as i go along all right and here's again look at this they're shoveling dust particles <laughs> all right like but you've got a standing building and again, I've I've done research in other cases, not having to do obviously with human combustion, but you know, true crime in this, where you know, uh, especially some of these like serial killers and other people that they try to get rid of a body by burning it. They'll even put it in these ovens, you know, if they've got access to them. And even then, they will still find teeth and other pieces that just do not burn away, even if the body's been stuck in there for like a really long time in very high heat. In other words, and there's other times that, and then, and then you, I'm sure you've heard of people that they'll say, by the time they find the body, they'll say, you know, there's there's evidence that whoever killed this person tried to burn them first. Again, thinking this thing that, oh, I'm just going to throw a match and this thing is going to, and they find they can't burn it. They can't burn it to the point of what they want to do with it because people will have this idea in their head of how efficient fire is and 
when it comes to disposing of bodies? Not really. Again, in some cases, you know, they, you know, they'll do it to maybe destroy DNA evidence or, or maybe make it difficult to identify the person, even though nowadays with DNA or dental records, they could still, but it's not as easy again to cover up even a crime by, by burning the body. This wigs me out that picture right there. And for my podcast listeners, this is two ladies legs, basically what's left of somebody that was sitting in a chair with just two legs and from the thighs down hanging out on the, hanging out on the thing. That's, that's, that's very disturbing. Yes, yes, yes. And, um, I would love to find out, I'm going to follow up with him as far as what happens with these other, this other book that he's going to do. All right. Where, um, you know, where he, where he details the, the background on all these cases, because I think, you know, because I, I'm, let's face it, I'm into the, I consider this part of the paranormal, even though you can tell he really comes around to this from a very, very scientific approach, which is great. But still, again, to me, it falls under the umbrella of the paranormal. And I guess my point is that to me, it's fascinating when somebody does the research tries to explain it scientifically, gathers all the information, gathers the data, the the reports, the interviews, and they still come around and there is no rational, what's this, a rational explanation for what happened, right? That's what I think, you know, you know, when it really gets interesting. And like I said, you know, some things that maybe now are looked at as paranormal or weird or unusual or unexplained 20 years from now, 30 years, 15 years from now, it'll be ah, And you guys, this is what, this is what was happening. All right. But you know, the, uh, again, same thing when he said that thing, which I got to look that up. Somebody has been struck by lightning seven times and survived. That's, I didn't know there was such a, I've heard of people that have, I've heard of there's, and I don't know exactly if there's a term used for it, for that once people get struck by lightning, you um, you become like an, an an attractor for it, or there's something like, hey, don't if if you're worried about getting struck by lightning, you get be extra careful once you get struck. Like there's something in the composition of your body that becomes like a a, a lightning strike magnet kind of deal. All those things, again, we don't understand exactly how it happens, but nonetheless, they do. And I think that's why it's so super interesting. And I really hope you like this interview with Larry Arnold. And like I said, I will put a link to his website on the credits of the show. Please check out his uh, information. Also, we'll keep tabs on when he gets this new book out. Because he absolutely, he's the, he's the he's the expert in this field, and see what other stories, what other cases are like that. Because this is definitely one of those phenomena that somehow or other you go round and round and round and just don't get a good explanation for it. So please don't forget to sign up for my uh, newsletter on Substack. Go to mppelliser.com, miamigoschronicles.com. All my podcasts are available on Spreaker, but they get distributed to all the different podcast platforms across the world. So you can find, like I said, Stories of the Supernatural, Nightshade Diary, or Supernatural Storytime, and of course the Comedy Nominator and all of those is me, M.P. Pelliser. And uh, again, thank you so much for sharing this time with me, and I look forward to interviewing another interesting person next week. Till then, take care.